Section 31 of The Genius by Theodore Dreiser. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Book Two, Chapter Three. Whatever were Eugene's secret thoughts, he began his married life with the outward air of one who takes it seriously enough. Now that he was married, was actually bound by legal ties, he felt that he might as well make the best of it. He had once had the notion that it might be possible to say nothing of his marriage and keep Angela in the background. But this notion had been dispelled by the attitude of McHugh and Smite to say nothing of Angela. So he began to consider the necessity of notifying his friends, Miriam Finch and Norma Whitmore, and possibly Christina Channing when she should return. These three women offered the largest difficulty to his mind. He felt the commentary which their personalities represented. What would they think of him? What of Angela? Now that she was right here in the city, he could see that she represented a different order of thought. He had opened the campaign by suggesting that they invite Smite and McHugh. The thing to do now was to go further in this matter. The one thing that troubled him was the thought of breaking the news to Miriam Finch, for Christina Channing was away, and Norma Whitmore was not of sufficient importance. He argued now that he should have done this beforehand, but having neglected that, it behooved him to act at once. He did so, finally, writing to Norma Whitmore and saying, for he had no long explanation to make, Yours truly is married. May I bring my wife up to see you? Miss Whitmore was truly taken by surprise. She was sorry at first, very, because Eugene interested her greatly, and she was afraid he would make a mistake in his marriage. But she hastened to make the best of a bad turn on the part of fate and wrote a note which ran as follows. Dear Eugene and Eugene's Wife, this is news as is news. Congratulations, and I'm coming right down as soon as I get my breath, and then you too must come to see me. Norma Whitmore. Eugene was pleased and grateful that she took it so nicely, but Angela was the least bit chagrined secretly that he had not told her before. Why hadn't he? Was this someone that he was interested in? Those three years in which she had doubtingly waited for Eugene had whetted her suspicions and nurtured her fears. Still, she tried to make little of it and to put on an air of joyousness. She would be so glad to meet Miss Whitmore. Eugene told her how kind she had been to him, how much she admired his art, how helpful she was in bringing together young literary and artistic people, and how influential with those who counted. She could do him many a good turn. Angela listened patiently, but she was just the least bit resentful that he should think so much of any one woman outside of herself. Why should he, Eugene Whitla, be dependent on the favor of any woman? Of course she must be very nice, and they would be good friends, but... Norma came one afternoon, two days later, with the atmosphere of enthusiasm trailing, as it seemed to Eugene, like a cloud of glory about her. She was both fire and strength to him in her regard and sympathy, even though she resented, every so slightly, his affectional desertion. "'You piggly wiggly Eugene Whitla!' she exclaimed. "'What do you mean by running off and getting married and never saying a word?' "'I never even had a chance to get you a present, and now I have to bring it. Isn't this a charming place? Why, it's perfectly delightful!' And as she laid her present down unopened, she looked about to see where Mrs. Eugene Whitla might be. Angela was in the bedroom, finishing her toilet. She was expecting this descent, and was so prepared, being suitably dressed in the light green house gown. When she heard Miss Whitmore's familiar mode of address, she winced, for this spoke volumes for a boon companionship of long endurance. Eugene hadn't said so much of Miss Whitmore in the past as he had recently but she could see that they were very intimate. She looked out and saw her, this tall, not very shapely, but graceful woman, 
whose whole being represented dynamic energy awareness subtlety of perception eugene was shaking her hand and looking genially into her face why should eugene like her so much she asked herself instantly why did his face shine with that light of intense enthusiasm the piggly wiggly eugene whitla expression irritated her it sounded as though she might be in love with him she came out after a moment with a glad smile on her face and approached with every show of good feeling but miss whitmore could sense opposition so this is mrs whitla she exclaimed kissing her i'm delighted to know you i've always wondered what sort of a girl mr whitla would marry you'll just have to pardon my calling him eugene i'll get over it after a bit i suppose now that he's married but we've been such good friends and i admire his work so much how do you like studio life or are you used to it angela who was taking in every detail of eugene's old friend replied in what seemed an affected tone that no she wasn't used to studio life she was just from the country you know a regular farmer girl blackwood wisconsin no less she stopped to let norma express friendly surprise and then went on to say that she supposed eugene had not said very much about her but he wrote her often enough she was rejoicing in the fact that whatever slight eugene's previous silence seemed to put upon her she had the satisfaction that she had won him after all and miss whitmore had not she fancied from miss whitmore's enthusiastic attitude that she must like eugene very much and she could see now what sort of a woman might have made him wish to delay who were the others she wondered they talked of metropolitan experiences generally marietta came in from a shopping expedition with a mrs link wife of an army captain acting as an instructor at west point and tea was served immediately afterward miss whitmore was insistent that they should come and take dinner with her some evening eugene confided that he was sending a painting to the academy they'll hang it of course assured norma but you ought to have an exhibition of your own marietta gushed about the wonder of the big stores and so it finally came time for miss whitmore to go now you will come up won't you she said to angela for in spite of a certain feeling of incompatibility and difference she was determined to like her she thought angela a little inexperienced and presumptuous in marrying eugene she was afraid she was not up to his standard still she was quaint piquant perhaps she would do very well angela was thinking all the while that miss whitmore was presuming on her old acquaintance with eugene that she was too affected and enthusiastic there was another day on which Miriam finch called richard wheeler having learned at smites and McHugh's studio of eugene's marriage and present whereabouts had hurried over and then immediately afterward off to marion finch's studio surprised himself he knew that she would be more so whitla's married he exclaimed bursting into her room and for the moment marion lost her self-possession sufficiently to reply almost dramatically richard wheeler what are you talking about you don't mean that do you he's married insisted wheeler and he's living down in washington square sixty-one is the number he has the cutest yellow-haired wife you ever saw angela had been nice to wheeler and he liked her he liked the air of this domicile and thought it was going to be a good thing for eugene he needed to settle down and work hard miriam winced mentally at the picture she was hurt by this deception of eugene's chagrined because he had not thought enough of her to indicate that he was going to get married he's been married ten days communicated wheeler and this added force to her temporary chagrin the fact that angela was yellow-haired and cute was also disturbing well she finally exclaimed cheerfully he might have said something to us mightn't he and she covered her own original confusion by gay nonchalance which showed nothing of what she was really thinking this was certainly indifference on eugene's part and yet why shouldn't he he had never proposed to her still they had been so intimate mentally she was interested to see angela she wondered what sort of a woman she really was 
yellow-haired, cute. Of course, like all men, Eugene had sacrificed intellect and mental charm for a dainty form and a pretty face. It seemed queer, but she had fancied that he would not do that, that his wife, if he ever took one, would be tall, perhaps, and gracious, and of a beautiful mind, someone distinguished. Why would men, intellectual men, artistic men, any kind of men, invariably make fools of themselves? Well, she would go and see her. Because Wheeler informed him that he had told Marion, Eugene wrote, saying as briefly as possible that he was married, and that he wanted to bring Angela to her studio. For reply, she came herself, gay, smiling, immaculately dressed, anxious to hurt Angela, because she had proved the victor. She also wanted to show Eugene how little difference it all made to her. "'You certainly are a secretive young man, Mr. Eugene Whitla,' she exclaimed when she saw him. "'Why didn't you make him tell us, Mrs. Whitla?' she demanded archly of Angela, but with a secret dagger thrust in her eyes. "'You'd think he didn't want us to know.' Angela cowered beneath the sting of this whipcord. Miriam made her feel as though Eugene had attempted to conceal his relationship to her, as though he was ashamed of her. How many more women were there like Miriam and Norma Whitmore? Eugene was gaily unconscious of the real animus in Miriam's conversation, and now that the first cruel movement was over, was talking glibly of things in general, anxious to make everything seem as simple and natural as possible. He was working at one of his pictures, when Miriam came in, and was eager to obtain her critical opinion, since it was nearly done. She squinted at it narrowly, but said nothing when he asked. Ordinarily, she would have applauded it vigorously. She did think it exceptional, but was determined to say nothing. She walked indifferently about, examining this and that object in a superior way, asking how he came to obtain the studio, congratulating him upon his good luck. Angela, she decided, was interesting, but not in Eugene's class mentally, and should be ignored. He had made a mistake that was plain. Now you must bring Mrs. Whitla up to see me, she said, on leaving. I'll play and sing all my latest songs for you. I have made some of the daintiest discoveries in old Italian and Spanish pieces. Angela, who had posed to Eugene, as knowing something about music, resented the superior invitation without inquiry as to her own possible ability or taste, as she did Miriam's entire attitude. Why was she so haughty, so superior? What was it to her whether Eugene had said anything about her or not? She said nothing to show that she herself played, but she wondered that Eugene said nothing. It seemed neglectful and inconsiderate of him. He was busy wondering what Miriam thought of his picture. Miriam took his hand warmly at parting, looked cheerfully into his eyes, and said, I know you two are going to be irrationally happy, and went out. Eugene felt the irritation at last. He knew Angela felt something. Miriam was resentful, that was it. She was angry at him for a seeming indifference. She had commented to herself on Angela's appearance, and to her disadvantage in her manner, had been the statement that his wife was not very important after all, not of the artistic and superior world to which she and he belonged. "'How do you like her?' he asked, tentatively, after she had gone, feeling a strong current of opposition, but not knowing on what it might be based exactly. "'I don't like her,' returned Angela petulantly. "'She thinks she's sweet.' She treats you as though she thought you were her personal property. She openly insulted me about your not telling her. Miss Whitmore did the same thing. They all do. They all will. Oh! She suddenly burst into tears and ran crying toward their bedroom. Eugene followed, astonished, ashamed, rebuked, guilty-minded, almost terror-stricken. He hardly knew what. Why, Angela, he urged pleadingly, leaning over her and attempting to raise her, you know that isn't true. It is, it is, she insisted. Don't touch me. Don't come near me. You know it's true. You don't love me. You haven't treated me right at all since I've been here. You haven't done anything that you should have done. 
she insulted me openly to my face she was speaking with sobs and eugene was at once pained and terrorized by the persistent and unexpected display of emotion he had never seen angela like this before he had never seen any woman so why angel face he urged how can you go on like this you know what you say isn't true what have i done you haven't told your friends that's what you haven't done she exclaimed between gasps they still think you're single you keep me here hidden in the background as though i were a were a i don't know what your friends come and insult me openly to my face they do they do oh she sobbed anew she knew very well what she was doing in her anger and rage she felt that she was acting in the right way eugene needed a severe reproof he had acted very badly and this was the way to administer it to him now in the beginning his conduct was indefensible and only the fact that he was an artist immersed in cloudy artistic thoughts and not really subject to the ordinary conventions of life saved him in her estimation it didn't matter that she had urged him to marry her it didn't absolve him that he had done so she thought he owed her that anyhow they were married now and he should do the proper thing eugene stood there cut as with a knife by this terrific charge he had not meant anything by concealing her presence he thought he had only endeavored to protect himself very slightly temporarily you oughtn't to say that angela he pleaded there aren't any more that don't know at least any more that i care anything about i didn't think i didn't mean to conceal anything i'll write to everybody that might be interested he still felt hurt that she should brutally attack him this way even in her sorrow he was wrong no doubt but she was this the way to act this the nature of true love he mentally writhed and twisted taking her up in his arms smoothing her hair he asked her to forgive him finally when she thought she had punished him enough and that he was truly sorry and would make amends in the future she pretended to listen and then of a sudden threw her arms about his neck and began to hug and kiss him passion of course was the end of this but the whole thing left a disagreeable taste in eugene's mouth he did not like scenes he preferred the lofty indifference of miriam the gay subterfuge of norma the supreme stoicism of christina channing this noisy tempestuous angry emotion was not quite the thing to have introduced into his life he did not see how that would make for love between them still angela was sweet he thought she was a little girl not as wise as norma whitmore nor as self-protective as miriam finch or christina channing perhaps after all she needed his care and affection maybe it was best for her and for him that he had married her so thinking he rocked her in his arms and angela lying there was satisfied she had won a most important victory she was starting right she was starting eugene right she would get the moral mental and emotional upper hand of him and keep it then these women who thought themselves so superior could go their way she would have eugene and he would be a great man and she would be his wife that was all she wanted end of section thirty one Section thirty two of the Genius by Theodore Dreiser. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Book two, chapter four. The result of Angela's outburst was that Eugene hastened to notify those whom he had not already informed. Schottmeyer, his father and mother, Sylvia, Myrtle, Hudson Dula, and received in return cards and letters of congratulation expressing surprise and interest which he presented to angela in a conciliatory spirit she realized after it was all over that she had given him an unpleasant shock and was anxious to make up to him in personal affection what she had apparently compelled him to suffer for policy's sake eugene did not know that in angela despite her smallness of body and what seemed to him her babyishness of spirit he had to deal with a thinking woman who was quite wise as to ways and means 
of handling her personal affairs. She was, of course, whirled in the maelstrom of her affection for Eugene, and this was confusing, and she did not understand the emotional and philosophic reaches of his mind. But she did understand instinctively what made for a stable relationship between husband and wife, and between any married couple and the world. To her, the utterance of the marriage vow meant just what it said, that they would cleave each to the other. There should be henceforth no thoughts, feelings, or emotions, and decidedly no actions which would not conform with the letter and the spirit of the marriage vow. Eugene had sensed something of this, but not accurately or completely. He did not correctly estimate either the courage or the rigidity of her beliefs and convictions. He thought that her character might possibly partake of some of his own easy tolerance and good nature. She must know that people, men particularly, were more or less unstable in their makeup. Life could not be governed by hard and fast rules. Why, everybody knew that. You might try, and you should hold yourself in check as much as possible for the sake of self-preservation and social appearances. But if you erred, and you might easily, it was no crime. Certainly it was no crime to look at another woman longingly. If you went astray, overbalanced by your desires, wasn't it, after all, in the scheme of things? Did we make our desires? Certainly we did not. And if we did not succeed completely in controlling them, well... The drift of life into which they now settled was interesting enough, though for Eugene it was complicated with the thought of possible failure. For he was, as might well be expected, of such a temperament, of a worrying nature, and inclined, in his hours of ordinary effort, to look on the dark side of things. The fact that he had married Angela against his will, the fact that he had no definite art connections, which produced him, as yet, anything more than two thousand dollars a year, the fact that he had assumed financial obligations, which doubled the cost of food, clothing, entertainment, and rent, for their studio was costing him thirty dollars more than had his share of the Smite McHugh chambers weighed on him. The dinner which he had given to Smite and McHugh had cost about eight dollars over and above the ordinary expenses of the week. Others of a similar character would cost as much and more. He would have to take Angela to the theater occasionally. There would be the need of furnishing a new studio the following fall, unless another such windfall as this manifested itself. Although Angela had equipped herself with a varied and serviceable trousseau, her clothes would not last forever. Odd necessities began to crop up not long after they were married. And he began to see that if they lived with anything like the freedom and care with which he had before he was married, his income would have to be larger and surer. The energy which these thoughts provoked was not without result. For one thing, he sent the original of the East Side picture, Six O'Clock, to the American Academy of Design exhibition, a thing which he might have done long before, but failed to do. Angela had heard from Eugene that the National Academy of Design was a forum for the display of art to which the public was invited or admitted for a charge. To have a picture accepted by the society and hung on the line was, in its way, a mark of merit and approval, though Eugene did not think very highly of it. All the pictures were judged by a jury of artists which decided whether they should be admitted or rejected, and, if admitted, whether they should be given a place of honor or hung in some inconspicuous position. To be hung on the line was to have your picture placed in the lower tier where the light was excellent and the public could get a good view of it. Eugene had thought the first two years he was in New York that he was really not sufficiently experienced or meritorious, and the previous year he had thought that he would hoard all that he was doing for his first appearance in some exhibition of his own, thinking the National Academy commonplace and retrogressive. The exhibitions he had seen thus far had been full of commonplace, 
dead and alive stuff, he thought. It was no great honor to be admitted to such a collection. Now, because McHugh was trying, and because he had accumulated nearly enough pictures for an exhibition at a private gallery which he hoped to interest, he was anxious to see what the standard body of American artists thought of his work. They might reject him. If so, that would merely prove that they did not recognize a radical departure from accepted methods and subject matter as art. The Impressionists, he understood, were being so ignored. Later they would accept him. If he were admitted, it would simply mean that they knew better than he believed they did. I believe I will do it, he said. I'd like to know what they think of my stuff anyhow. The picture was sent as he had planned, and to his immense satisfaction it was accepted and hung. It did not, for some reason, attract as much attention as it might, but it was not without its modicum of praise. Owen Overman, the poet, met him in the general reception entrance of the Academy on the opening night, and congratulated him sincerely. I remember seeing that, in truth, he said, but it's much better in the original. It's fine. You ought to do a lot of those things. I am, replied Eugene. I expect to have a show of my own one of these days. He called Angela, who had wandered away to look at a piece of statuary, and introduced her. I was just telling your husband how much I like his picture, Overman informed her. Angela was flattered that her husband was so much of a personage that he could have his picture hung in a great exhibition such as this, with its walls crowded with what seemed to her magnificent canvases, and its rooms filled with important and distinguished people. As they strolled about, Eugene pointed out to her this well-known artist and that writer, saying almost always that they were very able. He knew three or four of the celebrated collectors, prize-givers, and art patrons by sight, and told Angela who they were. There were a number of striking-looking models present, whom Eugene knew either by reputation, whispered comment of friends, or personally. Zelma Desmond, who had posed for Eugene, Helda Anderson, Anna Magruder, and Laura Mathewson, among others. Angela was struck, and, in a way, taken by the dash and beauty of these girls. They carried themselves with an air of personal freedom and courage which surprised her. Hedda Anderson was bold in her appearance, but immensely smart. Her manner seemed to comment on the ordinary woman as being indifferent and not worthwhile. She looked at Angela, walking with Eugene, and wondered who she was. "'Isn't she striking?' observed Angela, not knowing she was anyone whom Eugene knew. "'I know her well,' he replied. "'She's a model.' Just then Miss Anderson, in return for his nod, gave him a fetching smile. Angela chilled. Elizabeth Stein passed by, and he nodded to her. "'Who is she?' asked Angela. "'She's a socialist agitator and radical.' She sometimes speaks from a soapbox on the east side. Angela studied her carefully. Her waxen complexion, smooth black hair, laid at even plates over her forehead, her straight, thin, chiseled nose, even red lips and low forehead, indicated a daring and subtle soul. Angela did not understand her. She could not understand a girl as good-looking as that, doing any such thing as Eugene said. And yet, she had a bold, rather free and easy air. She thought Eugene certainly knew strange people. He introduced her to William McConnell, Hudson Dula, who had not yet been to see them, Jan Janssen, Louis Disa, Leonard Baker, and Peytner Stone. In regard to Eugene's picture, the papers, with one exception, had nothing to say, but this one in both Eugene's and Angela's minds made up for all the others. It was the evening sun, a most excellent medium for art opinion, and it was very definite in its conclusion in regard to this particular work. The statement was, A new painter, Eugene Whitla, has an oil entitled Six O'Clock, which for directness, virility, sympathy, faithfulness to detail, and what, for want of a better term, we may call totality of spirit, 
is quite the best thing in the exhibition. It looks rather out of place, surrounded by the weak and spindling interpretations of scenery and water, which so readily find a place in the exhibition of the Academy. But it is none the weaker for that. The artist has a new, crude, raw, and almost rough method, but his picture seems to say quite clearly what he sees and feels. He may have to wait, if this is not a single burst of ability, but he will have a hearing. There is no question of that. Eugene Whitla is an artist. Eugene thrilled when he read this commentary. It was quite what he would have said himself if he had dared. Angela was beside herself with joy. Who was the critic who had said this, they wondered. What was he like? He must be truly an intellectual personage. Eugene wanted to go and look him up. If one saw his talent now, others would see it later. It was for this reason, though the picture subsequently came back to him unsold, and unmentioned so far as merit or prizes were concerned, that he decided to try for an exhibition of his own. End of section 32「thirty three of the genius by theodore dreiser this librivox recording is in the public domain book two chapter five the hope of fame what hours of speculation what pulses of enthusiasm what fevers of effort are based on that peculiarly subtle illusion it is yet the lure the ignis fatis of almost every breathing heart in the young particularly it burns with the sweetness and perfume of spring fires then most of all does there seem substantial reality in the shadow of fame those deep beautiful illusions which tremendous figures throw over the world attainable it seems must be the peace and plenty and sweet content of fame that glamour of achievement that never was on sea or land fame partakes of the beauty and the freshness of the morning it has in it the odor of the rose the feel of rich satin the color of the cheeks of youth if we could but be famous when we dream of fame and not when locks are tinged with gray faces seamed with the lines that speak of past struggles and eyes wearied with the tensity the longings and the despair of years to bestride the world in the morning of life, to walk amid the plaudits and huzzas when love and faith are young, to feel youth and the world's affection when youth and health are sweet, what dream is that of pure sunlight and moonlight compounded, a sun-kissed breath of the mist in the sky, the reflection of moonlight upon water, the remembrance of dreams to the waking mind, of such is fame in our youth, and never afterward. By such an illusion was Eugene's mind possessed. He had no conception of what life would bring him for his efforts. He thought if he could have his pictures hung in a Fifth Avenue gallery, much as he had seen Bougarot's Venus in Chicago, with people coming as he had come on that occasion, it would be of great comfort and satisfaction to him. If he could paint something which would be purchased by the Metropolitan Museum in New York, he would then be somewhat of a classic figure, ranking with Corot, Dubinet, and Rousseau of the French, or with Turner and Watts and Millet of the English, the leading artistic figures of his pantheon. These men seemed to have something which he did not have, he thought, a greater breadth of technique a finer comprehension of color and character, a feeling for the subtleties at the back of life which somehow showed through what they did. Larger experience, larger vision, larger feeling. These things seemed to be eminent in the great pictures exhibited here, and it made him a little uncertain of himself. Only the criticism in the evening sun fortified him against all thought of failure. He was an artist. He gathered up the various oils he had done. There were some twenty-six all told now. Scenes of the rivers, the streets, the nightlife, and so forth, and went over them carefully, 
touching up details which in the beginning he had merely sketched or indicated, adding to the force of a spot of color here, modifying a tone or shade there, and finally, after much brooding over the possible result, set forth to find a gallery which would give them place and commercial approval. Eugene's feeling was that they were a little raw and sketchy, that they might not have sufficient human appeal, seeing that they dealt with factory architecture at times, scows, tugs, engines, the elevated roads in raw reds, yellows, and blacks. But McHugh, Dula, Smite, Miss Finch, Christina, the Evening Sun, Norma Whitmore, all had praised them, or some of them. Was not the world much more interested in the form and spirit of classic beauty, such as that represented by Sir John Millais? Would it not prefer Rossetti's Blessed Demoiselle to any street scene ever painted? He could never be sure. In the very hour of his triumph, when the sun had just praised his picture, there lurked the specter of possible intrinsic weakness. Did the world wish this sort of thing? Would it ever buy of him? Was he of any real value? No, artist heart, one might have answered, of no more value than any other worker of existence, and no less. The sunlight on the corn, the color of dawn in the maid's cheek, the moonlight on the water, these are of value and of no value, according to the soul to whom is the appeal. Fear not. Of dreams and the beauty of dreams is the world compounded. Keller and Sons, purveyor of artistic treasures, by both past and present masters, with offices in Fifth Avenue near 28th Street, was the one truly significant firm of art dealers in the city. The pictures in the windows of Keller and Sons, the exhibitions in their very exclusive showrooms, the general approval which their discriminating taste evoked, had attracted the attention of artists and the lay public for fully thirty years. Eugene had followed their shows with interest ever since he had been in New York. He had seen, every now and then, a most astonishing picture of one school or another displayed in their imposing shop window, and had heard artists comment from time to time on other things there with considerable enthusiasm. The first important picture of the Impressionistic school, a heavy spring rain in a grove of silver poplars by Winthrop, had been shown in the window of this firm, fascinating Eugene with its technique. He had encountered here collections of Aubrey Beardsley decadent drawings, of Helleu's silver points, of Rodin's astonishing sculptors, and Thelot's solid Scandinavian eclecticism. This house appeared to have capable artistic connections all over the world, for the latest art force in Italy, Spain, Switzerland, or Sweden was quite as likely to find its timely expression here as the more accredited work of England, Germany, or France. Keller and Son were art connoisseurs in the best sense of the word, and although the German founder of the house had died many years before, its management and taste had never deteriorated. Eugene did not know at this time how very difficult it was to obtain an exhibition under Kellner's auspices they being overcrowded with offers of art material and appeals for display from celebrated artists who were quite willing and able to pay for the space and time they occupied. A fixed charge was made, never deviated from, except in rare instances where the talent of the artist, his poverty, and the advisability of the exhibition were extreme. Two hundred dollars was considered little enough for the use of one of their showrooms for ten days. Eugene had no such sum to spare, but one day in January, without any real knowledge as to what the conditions were, he carried four of the reproductions which had been made from time to time, in truth, to the office of Mr. Keller, certain that he had something to show. Miss Whitmore had indicated to him that Eberhardt Zang wanted him to come and see him. But he thought if he was going anywhere, he would prefer to go to Kellner and Son. He wanted to explain to Mr. Kellner, if there was such a person, that he had many more paintings, which he considered even better, more expressive of his growing understanding of American life and of himself 
and his technique. He went in timidly, albeit with quite an air, for this adventure disturbed him much. The American manager of Kellner and Son, Monsieur Anatole Charles, was a Frenchman by birth and training, familiar with the spirit and history of French art, and with the drift and tendency of art in various other sections of the world. He had been sent here by the home office in Berlin, not only because of his very thorough training in English art ways, and because of his ability to select that type of picture which would attract attention and bring credit and prosperity to the house here and abroad, but also because of his ability to make friends among the rich and powerful wherever he was, and to sell one type of important picture after another, having some knack or magnetic capacity for attracting to him those who cared for good art and were willing to pay for it. His specialties, of course, were the canvases of the eminently successful artists in various parts of the world, the living successful. He knew by experience what sold, here, in France, in England, in Germany. He was convinced that there was practically nothing of value in American art as yet, certainly not from the commercial point of view, and very little from the artistic. Beyond a few canvases by Inés, Homer, Sargent, Abbey, Whistler, men who were more foreign or rather universal than American in their attitude, he considered that the American art spirit was as yet young and raw and crude. They do not seem to be grown up as yet over here, he said to his intimate friends. They paint little things in a forceful way, but they do not seem as yet to see things as a whole. I miss that sense of the universe in miniature which we find in the canvases of so many of the great Europeans. They are better illustrators than artists over here. Why, I don't know. Monsieur Anatole Charles spoke English almost more than perfectly. He was an example of your true man of the world, polished, dignified, immaculately dressed, conservative in thought, and of few words in expression. Critics and art enthusiasts were constantly running to him with this and that suggestion in regard to this and that artist. But he only lifted his sophisticated eyebrows, curled his superior mustachios, pulled at his highly artistic goatee, and exclaimed, Ah! or so. He asserted always that he was most anxious to find talent, profitable talent, though on occasion, and he would demonstrate that, by an outward wave of his hands and a shrug of his shoulders, the house of Kellner and Son was not adverse to doing what it could for art, and that for art's sake, without any thought of profit whatsoever. Where are your artists, he would ask? I look and look. Whistler, Abbey, Inez, Sargent. Ah, they are old. Where are the new ones? Well, this one, the critic, would probably persist. Well, well, I go, I shall look. But I have little hope, very, very little hope. He was constantly appearing under such pressure, at this studio and that, examining, criticizing. Alas, he selected the work of but few artists for purpose of public exhibition, and usually charged them well for it. It was this man, polished, artistically superb in his way, whom Eugene was destined to meet this morning. When he entered the sumptuously furnished office of Monsieur Charles, the latter arose. He was seated at a little rosewood desk, lighted by a lamp with green silk shade. One glance told him that Eugene was an artist, very likely of ability, more than likely of a sensitive, high-strung nature. He had long since learned that politeness and savoir-faire cost nothing. It was the first essential so far as the goodwill of an artist was concerned. Eugene's card and message, brought by a uniformed attendant, had indicated the nature of his business. As he approached, M. Charles's raised eyebrows indicated that he would be very pleased to know what he could do for Mr. Whitla. "'I should like to show you several reproductions of pictures of mine,' began Eugene, in his most courageous manner. "'I have been working on a number, with a view to making a show, and I thought that possibly you might be interested in looking at them, 
with a view to displaying them for me. I have twenty-six, all told, and... Ah, that is a difficult thing to suggest, replied M. Charles cautiously. We have a great many exhibitions scheduled now, enough to carry us through two years, if we considered nothing more. Obligations to artists, with whom we have dealt in the past, take up a great deal of our time. Contracts, which our Berlin and Paris branches enter into, sometimes crowd out our local shows entirely. Of course, we are always anxious to make interesting exhibitions, if opportunity should permit. You know our charges? No, said Eugene, surprised that there should be any. Two hundred dollars for two weeks. We do not take exhibitions for less than that time. Eugene's countenance fell. He had expected quite a different reception. Nevertheless, since he had brought them, he untied the tape of the portfolio in which the prints were laid. M. Charles looked at them curiously. He was much impressed with the picture of the East Side crowd at first, but looking at one of Fifth Avenue in a snowstorm, the battered, shabby bus pulled by a team of lean, unkept, bony horses, he paused, struck by its force. He liked the delineation of swirling, wind-driven snow, the emptiness of this thoroughfare usually so crowded, the buttoned, huddled, hunched, withdrawn look of those who traveled it, the exceptional details of piles of snow sifted on to window-sills and ledges and into doorways and on the windows of the bus itself attracted his attention. An effective detail, he said to Eugene, as one critic might say to another, pointing to a line of white snow on the window of one side of the bus. Another dash of snow on a man's hat rim took his eye also. I can feel the wind, he added. Eugene smiled. Monsieur Charles passed on in silence to the steaming tug coming up the East River in the dark, hauling two great freight barges. He was saying to himself that, after all, Eugene's art was that of merely seizing upon the obviously dramatic. It wasn't so much the art of color composition and life analysis as it was stagecraft. The man before him had the ability to see the dramatic side of life. Still, he turned to the last reproduction, which was that of Greeley Square in a drizzling rain. Eugene, by some mystery of his art, had caught the exact texture of seeping water on gray stones in the glare of various electric lights. He had caught the values of various kinds of lights, those in cabs, those in cable cars, those in shop windows, those in street lamps, relieving by them the dark shadows of the crowds and of the sky. The color work here was unmistakably good. How large are the originals of these? he asked thoughtfully. Nearly all of them thirty by forty. Eugene could not tell by his manner whether he was merely curious or interested. All of them done in oil, I fancy. Yes, all. They are not bad, I must say, he observed cautiously, a little persistently dramatic, but... These reproductions began Eugene, hoping, by criticizing the press work to interest him in the superior quality of the originals. Yes, I see, Monsieur Charles interrupted, knowing full well what was coming. They are very bad, Still they show well enough what the originals are like. Where's your studio? 61 Washington Square. As I say, went on Monsieur Charles, noting the address on Eugene's card, the opportunity for exhibition purposes is very limited and our charge is rather high. We have so many things we would like to exhibit, so many things we must exhibit. It is hard to say when the situation would permit, if you are interested, I might come and see them some time. Eugene looked perturbed. Two hundred dollars. Two hundred dollars could he afford it? It would mean so much to him. And yet the man was not at all anxious to rent him the showroom at even this price. I will come, said Monsieur Charles, seeing his mood, if you wish. That is what you want me to do. We have to be careful of what we exhibit here. It isn't as if it were an ordinary showroom. I will drop you a card some day, when occasion offers, if you wish, and you can let me know whether the time I suggest is all right. 
I am rather anxious to see these scenes of yours. They are very good of their kind. It may be, one never can tell, an opportunity might offer, a week or ten days, somewhere in between other things. Eugene sighed inwardly. So this was how things were done. It wasn't very flattering. Still, he must have an exhibition. He could afford two hundred if he had to. An exhibition elsewhere would not be so valuable. He had expected to make a better impression than this. I wish you would come, he said, at last meditatively. I think I should like the space if I can get it. I would like to know what you think. Monsieur Charles raised his eyebrows. Very well, he said. I will communicate with you. Eugene went out. What a poor thing this exhibiting business was, he thought. Here he had been dreaming of an exhibition at Kellner's, which should be brought about without charge to him, because they were tremendously impressed with his work. Now they did not even want his pictures, would charge him two hundred dollars to show them. It was a great come-down, very discouraging. Still he went home thinking it would do him some good. The critics would discuss his work, just as they did that of other artists. They would have to see what he could do, should it be that at last this thing which he had dreamed of and so deliberately planned had come true? He had thought of an exhibition at Kellner's as the last joyous thing to be attained in the world of rising art, and now it looked as though he was near it. It might actually be coming to pass. This man wanted to see the rest of his work. He was not opposed to looking at them. What a triumph even that was! End of section 33、section、thirty four of the genius by Theodore Dreiser. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Book two, chapter six. It was some little time before Monsieur Charles condescended to write, saying that if it was agreeable. He would call Wednesday morning, January sixteenth, at ten a.m. But the letter finally did come, and this dispelled all his intermediary doubts and fears. At last, he was to have a hearing. This man might see something in his work, possibly take a fancy to it. Who could tell? He showed the letter to Angela with an easy air, as though it were quite a matter of course. But he felt intensely hopeful. Angela put the studio in perfect order, for she knew what this visit meant to Eugene, and in her eager, faithful way, was anxious to help him as much as possible. She bought flowers from the Italian florist at the corner, and put them in vases here and there. She swept and dusted, dressed herself immaculately in her most becoming house dress, and waited with nerves at high tension for the fateful ring of the doorbell. Eugene pretended to work at one of his pictures, which he had done long before, the raw jangling wall of an East Side street, with its swarm of children, its shabby push carts, its mass of eager shuffling, pushing mortals, the sense of a rugged ground life running all through it. But he had no heart for the work. He was asking himself over and over what Monsieur Charles would think. Thank heaven the studio looked so charming. Thank heaven Angela was so dainty in her pale green gown, with a single red coral pin at her throat. He walked to the window and stared out at Washington Square, with its bare, wind-shaken branches of trees, its snow, its ant-like pedestrians hurrying here and there. If he were only rich, how peacefully he would paint! Monsieur Charles could go to the devil. The doorbell rang. Angela clicked the button, and up came Monsieur Charles quietly. They could hear his steps in the hall. He knocked, and Eugene answered, decidedly nervous in his mind, but outwardly calm and dignified. Monsieur Charles entered, clad in a fur-lined overcoat, fur cap, and yellow chamois gloves. Ah, good morning," said Monsieur Charles in greeting. "A fine, bracing day, isn't it?" What a charming view you have here, Mrs. Whitla! I'm delighted to meet you. I am a little late, but I was unavoidably detained. 
one of our german associates is in the city he divested himself of his great coat and rubbed his hands before the fire he tried now that he had unbent so far to be genial and considerate if he and eugene were to do any business in the future it must be so besides the picture on the easel before him near the window which for the time being he pretended not to see was an astonishing virile thing of whose work did it remind him anybody's he confessed to himself as he stirred around among the numerous art memories that he recalled nothing exactly like it raw reds raw greens dirty gray paving stones such faces why this thing fairly shouted its facts it seemed to say i'm dirty i am commonplace i am grim i am shabby but i am life and there was no apologizing for anything in it no glossing anything over bang smash crack came the facts one after another with a bitter brutal insistence on their soness why on moody days when he had felt sour and depressed he had seen somewhere a street that looked like this and there it was dirty sad slovenly immoral drunken anything everything but here it was thank god for a realist he said to himself as he looked for he knew life this cold connoisseur but he made no sign he looked at the tall slim frame of eugene his cheeks slightly sunken his eyes bright an artist every inch of him and then at angela small eager a sweet loving little woman and he was glad that he was going to be able to say that he would exhibit these things well he said pretending to look at the picture on the easel for the first time we might as well begin to look at these things i see you have one here very good i think quite forceful what others have you eugene was afraid this one hadn't appealed to him as much as he hoped it would and set it aside quickly picking up the second in the stock which stood against the wall covered by a green curtain it was the three engines entering the great freight yard abreast the smoke of the engines towering straight up like tall whitish gray plumes in the damp cold air the sky lowering with blackish gray clouds the red and yellow and blue cars standing out in the sodden darkness because of the water you could feel the cold wet drizzle the soppy tracks the weariness of throwing switches there was a lone brakeman in the foreground throwing a red brake signal he was quite black and evidently wet a symphony in gray said mr charles succinctly they came swiftly after this without much comment from either eugene putting one canvas after another before him leaving it for a few moments and replacing it with another his estimate of his own work did not rise very rapidly for m charles was persistently distant but the latter could not help voicing approval of after the theatre a painting full of the wonder and bustle of a night crowd under sputtering electric lamps he saw that eugene had covered almost every phase of what might be called the dramatic spectacle in the public life of the city and much that did not appear dramatic until he touched it the empty canyon of broadway at three o'clock in the morning a long line of giant milk wagons swinging curious lanterns coming up from the docks at four o'clock in the morning a plunging parade of fire vehicles the engines steaming smoke the people running or staring open mouth a crowd of polite society figures emerging from the opera the bread line an Italian boy throwing pigeons in the air from a basket on his arm in a crowded lower west side street. Everything he touched seemed to have romance and beauty, and yet it was real and mostly grim and shabby. I congratulate you, Mr. Whitla, finally exclaimed Monsieur Charles, moved by the ability of the man and the feeling that caution was no longer necessary. To me this is wonderful material much more effective than the reproductions show dramatic and true i question whether you will make any money out of it there is very little sale for american art in this country 
it might almost do better in europe it ought to sell but that is another matter the best things do not always sell readily it takes time still i will do what i can i will give these pictures a two weeks display early in april without any charge to you whatever eugene started i will call them to the attention of those who know i will speak to those who buy it is an honor i assure you to do this i consider you an artist in every sense of the word i might say a great artist you ought if you preserve yourself sanely and with caution to go far very far i shall be glad to send for these when the time comes eugene did not know how to reply to this he did not quite understand the european seriousness of method its appreciation of genius which was thus so easily and sincerely expressed in a formal way Monsieur charles meant every word he said this was one of those rare and gratifying moments of his life when he was permitted to extend a waiting and unrecognized genius the assurance of the consideration and approval of the world he stood there waiting to hear what eugene would say but the latter only flushed under his pale skin i'm very glad he said at last in his rather commonplace offhand american way i thought they were pretty good but i wasn't sure i'm very grateful to you you need not feel gratitude toward me returned monsieur charles now modifying his formal manner you can congratulate yourself your art i am honored as i tell you we will make a fine display of them you have no frames for these well never mind i will lend you frames he smiled and shook eugene's hand and congratulated angela she had listened to this address with astonishment and swelling pride she had perceived despite eugene's manner the anxiety he was feeling the intense hopes he was building on the outcome of this meeting Monsieur charles opening manner had deceived her she had felt that he did not care so much after all and that eugene was going to be disappointed now when this burst of approval came she hardly knew what to make of it she looked at eugene and saw that he was intensely moved by not only a sense of relief but pride and joy his pale dark face showed it to see this load of care taken off him whom she loved so deeply was enough to unsettle angela she found herself stirred in a pathetic way and now when m charles turned to her tears welled to her eyes don't cry mrs witla he said grandly on seeing this you have a right to be proud of your husband he's a great artist you should take care of him oh i'm so happy half laughed and half sobbed angela i can't help it she went over to where eugene was and put her face against his coat eugene slipped his arm about her and smiled sympathetically Monsieur charles smiled also proud of the effect of his words you both have a right to feel very happy he said little angela thought eugene this was your true wife for you your good woman her husband's success meant all to her she had no life of her own nothing outside of him and his good fortune Monsieur charles smiled well i will be going now he said finally i will send for the pictures when the time comes and meanwhile you two must come with me to dinner i will let you know he bowed himself out with many assurances of good will and then angela and eugene looked at each other oh isn't it lovely honey bun she cried half giggling half crying she had begun to call him honey bun the first day they were married my eugene a great artist he said it was a great honor isn't that lovely and all the world is going to know it soon now isn't that fine oh dear i'm so proud and she threw her arms ecstatically about his neck eugene kissed her affectionately he was not thinking so much of her as he was of kellner and son their great exhibit room the appearance of these twenty-seven or thirty great pictures in gold frames the spectators who might come to see the newspaper criticisms the voices of approval now all his artist friends would know that he was considered a great artist he was to have a chance to associate on equal terms with men like sergeant and whistler if he ever met them 
the world would hear of him widely his fame might go to the uttermost parts of the earth he went to the window after a time and looked out there came back to his mind alexandria the printing shop the people's furniture company in chicago the art students league the daily globe surely he had come by devious paths gee he exclaimed at last simply smite and McHugh will be glad to hear this i'll have to go over and tell them end of section thirty four section thirty five of the genius by theodore dreiser this librivox recording is in the public domain book two chapter seven the exhibition which followed in april was one of those things which happened to fortunate souls a complete flowering out before the eyes of the world of its feelings emotions perceptions and understanding we all have our feelings and emotions but lack the power of self-expression it is true the work and actions of any man are to some degree expressions of character but this is a different thing the details of most lives are not held up for public examination at any given time we do not see succinctly in any given place just what an individual thinks and feels even the artist is not always or often given the opportunity of collected public expression under conspicuous artistic auspices some are so fortunate many are not eugene realized that fortune was showering its favors upon him when the time came m charles was so kind as to send for the pictures and to arrange all the details he had decided with eugene that because of the vigor of treatment and the prevailing color scheme black frames would be the best the principal exhibition room on the ground floor in which these paintings were to be hung was heavily draped in red velvet and against this background the different pictures stood out effectively eugene visited the showroom at the time the pictures were being hung with angela with smite and McHugh, schottmeyer and others he had long since notified norma whitmore and miriam finch but not the latter until after wheeler had had time to tell her this also chagrined her for she felt in this as she had about his marriage that he was purposely neglecting her the dream finally materialized a room eighteen by forty hung with dark red velvet irradiated with a soft illuminating glow from hidden lamps in which eugene's pictures stood forth in all their rawness and reality almost as vigorous as life itself to some people those who do not see life clearly and directly but only through other people's eyes they seemed more so for this reason eugene's exhibition of pictures was an astonishing thing to most of those who saw it it concerned phases of life which in the main they had but casually glanced at things which because they were commonplace and customary were supposedly beyond the pale of artistic significance one picture in particular a great hulking ungainly negro a positively animal man his ears thick and projecting his lips fat his nose flat his cheek bones prominent his whole body expressing brute strength and animal indifference to dirt and cold illustrated this point particularly he was standing in a cheap commonplace east side street the time evidently was a january or february morning his business was driving an ash cart and his occupation at that moment illustrated by the picture was that of lifting a great can of mixed ashes paper and garbage to the edge of the ungainly iron wagon his hands were immense and were covered with great red patched woolen and leather gloves dirty bulbous inconvenient one would have said his head and ears were swaddled about by a red flannel shawl or strip of cloth which was knotted under his pugnacious chin and his forehead shawl and all surmounted by a brown canvas cap with his badge and number as a garbage driver on it about his waist was tied a great piece of rough coffee sacking and his arms and legs 
looked as though he might have on two or three pair of trousers and as many vests. He was looking pure blindly down the shabby street, its hard crisp snow littered with tin cans, paper, bits of slop, and offal. Dust, gray ash dust, was flying from his upturned can. In the distance behind him was a milk wagon, a few pedestrians, and a thinly clad girl coming out of a delicatessen store. Overhead were dull, small pane windows, some shutters with a few of their slats broken out, a frowsy-headed man looking out, evidently to see whether the day was cold. Eugene was so cruel in his indictment of life. He seemed to lay on his details with bitter lack of consideration. Like a slave driver, lashing a slave, he spared no least shade of his cutting brush. Thus, and thus, and thus, he seemed to say, is it. What do you think of this, and this, and this? People came and stared. Young society matrons, art dealers, art critics, the literary element who were interested in art, some musicians, and because the newspapers made a special mention of it, quite a number of those who run wherever they imagine there is something interesting to see. It was quite a notable two weeks display. Miriam Finch, though she never admitted to Eugene that she had seen it, she would not give him that satisfaction. Norma Whitmore, William McConnell, Louis Dessa, Owen Overman, Peytner Stone, the whole ruck and rabble of literary and artistic life came. There were artists of great ability there whom Eugene had never seen before. It would have pleased him immensely if he had chanced to see several of the city's most distinguished social leaders looking, at one time and another, at his pictures. All his observers were astonished at his virility, curious as to his personality, curious as to what motive or significance or point of view it might have. The more electrically cultured turned to the newspapers to see what the art critics would say of this, how they would label it. Because of the force of the work, the dignity, and critical judgment of Kellner and Son, the fact that the public, of its own instinct and volition, was interested, most of the criticisms were favorable. One art publication, connected with and representative of the conservative tendencies of a great publishing house, denied the merit of the collection as a whole, ridiculed the artist's insistence on shabby details as having artistic merit, denied that he could draw accurately, denied that he was a lover of pure beauty, and accused him of having no higher ideal than that of desire to shock the current masses by painting brutal things brutally. Mr. Whitla, wrote this critic, would no doubt be flattered if he were referred to as an American Millet. The brutal exaggeration of the painter's art would probably testify to him of his own merit. He is mistaken. The great Frenchman was a lover of humanity, a reformer in spirit, a master of drawing and composition. There was nothing of this cheap desire to startle and offend by what he did. If we are to have ash cans and engines and broken down bus horses thrust down our throats as art, heaven preserve us. We had better turn to commonplace photography at once and be done with it. Broken window shutters, dirty pavements, half frozen ash cart drivers, overdrawn, heavily exaggerated figures of policemen, tenement harridans, beggars, panhandlers, sandwich men, of such is art according to Eugene Whitla. Eugene winced when he read this. For the time being it seemed true enough. His art was shabby, yet there were others like Luke Severus who went to the other extreme. A true sense of the pathetic, a true sense of the dramatic, the ability to endow color, not with its photographic value, though to the current thought it may seem so, but with its higher spiritual significance the ability to indict life with its own grossness, to charge it prophetically with its own meanness and cruelty in order that mayhap it may heal itself, the ability to see wherein is beauty, even in shame and pathos and degradation. Of such is this man's work. He comes from the soil, apparently, fresh to a great task. 
there is no fear here no bowing to traditions no recognition of any of the accepted methods it is probable that he may not know what the accepted methods are so much the better we have a new method the world is the richer for that as we have said before mr witla may have to wait for his recognition it is certain that these pictures will not be quickly purchased and hung in parlors the average art lover does not take to a new thing so readily but if he persevere if his art does not fail him his turn will come it cannot fail he is a great artist may he live to realize it consciously and in his own soul tears leaped to eugene's eyes when he read this the thought that he was a medium for some noble and superhuman purpose thickened the cords in his throat until they felt like a lump he wanted to be a great artist he wanted to be worthy of the appreciation that was thus extended to him he thought of all the writers and artists and musicians and connoisseurs of pictures who would read this and remember him it was just possible that from now onwards some of his pictures would sell he would be so glad to devote himself to this sort of thing to quit magazine illustration entirely how ridiculous the latter was how confined and unimportant henceforth unless driven by sheer necessity he would do it no more they should beg in vain he was an artist in the true sense of the word a great painter ranking with whistler sergeant velasquez and turner let the magazines with their little ephemeral circulation go their way he was for the whole world he stood at the window of his studio one day while the exhibition was still in progress angela by his side thinking of all the fine things that had been said no picture had been sold but monsieur charles told him that some might be taken before it was all over i think if i make any money out of this he said to angela we will go to paris this summer i have always wanted to see paris in the fall we'll come back and take a studio uptown they are building some dandy ones up in sixty-fifth street he was thinking of the artists who could pay three and four thousand dollars a year for a studio he was thinking of men who made four five six and even eight hundred dollars out of every picture they painted if he could do that or if he could get a contract for a mural decoration for next winter he had very little money laid by he had spent most of his time this winter working with these pictures oh eugene exclaimed angela it seems so wonderful i can hardly believe it you a really truly great artist and us going to paris oh isn't that beautiful it seems like a dream i think and think but it's hard to believe that i am here sometimes and that your pictures are up at kellner's and oh she clung to him in an ecstasy of delight out in the park the leaves were just budding it looked as though the whole square were hung with transparent green net spangled as was the net in his room with tiny green leaves songsters were idling in the sun sparrows were flying noisily about in small clouds pigeons were picking lazily between the car tracks of the street below i might get a group of pictures illustrative of paris you can't tell what we'll find charles says he will have another exhibition for me next spring if i get the material ready he pushed his arms above his head and yawned deliciously he wondered what miss finch thought now he wondered where christina channing was there was never a word in the papers yet as to what had become of her he knew what norma whitmore thought she was apparently as happy as though the exhibition had been her own well i must go and get your lunch honey bun exclaimed angela i have to go to mr gioletti the grocer and mr rugelier the vegetable man she laughed for the italian names amused her eugene went back to his easel he was thinking of christina where was she at that moment if he had known she was looking at his pictures only newly returned from europe she had seen a notice in the evening post such work christina thought such force oh what a delightful artist and he was with me her mind went back to florizel and the amphitheatre among the trees he called me diana of the mountains she thought his hamadryad 
his huntress of the morn. She knew he was married. An acquaintance of hers had written in December. The past was past with her. She wanted no more of it. But it was beautiful to think upon a delicious memory. What a queer girl I am, she thought. Still she wished she could see him again, not face to face, but somewhere where he could not see her. She wondered if he was changing, if he would ever change. He was so beautiful then, to her. End of section 35「Section thirty six of the Genius by Theodore Dreiser. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Book two, chapter eight. Paris now loomed bright in Eugene's imagination, the prospect mingling with a thousand other delightful thoughts. Now that he had attained to the dignity of a public exhibition, which had been notably commented upon by the newspapers and art journals, and had been so generally attended by the elect, artists, critics, writers, generally, seemed to know of him. There were many who were anxious to meet and greet him, to speak approvingly of his work. It was generally understood, apparently, that he was a great artist not exactly arrived to the fullness of his stature as yet, being so new, but on his way. Among those who knew him, he was, by this one exhibition, lifted almost in a day to a lonely height, far above the puny efforts of such men as Smite and McHugh, McConnell and Disa, the whole world of small artists whose canvases packed the semi-annual exhibition of the National Academy of Design and the Watercolor Society, and with whom, in a way, he had been associated. He was a great artist now, recognized as such by the eminent critics who knew, and as such, from now on, would be expected to do the work of a great artist. One phrase in the criticism of Luke Severus in the evening sun, as it appeared during the run of his exhibition, remained in his memory clearly. If he perseveres, if his art does not fail him. Why should his art fail him, he asked himself. He was immensely pleased to hear from Monsieur Charles, at the close of the exhibition, that three of his pictures had been sold. One for three hundred dollars, to Henry McKenna, a banker. Another, the East Side Street scene, which Monsieur Charles so greatly admired, to Isaac Wertheim, for five hundred dollars. A third, one of the three engines and the railroad yard, to Robert C. Winchin, a railroad man, first vice president of one of the great railroads entering New York, also for five hundred dollars. Eugene had never heard of either Mr. McKenna or Mr. Winchin, but he was assured that they were men of wealth and refinement. At Angela's suggestion, he asked Monsieur Charles if he would not accept one of his pictures as a slight testimony of his appreciation for all he had done for him. Eugene would not have thought to do this. He was so careless and unpractical. But Angela thought of it, and saw that he did it. Monsieur Charles was greatly pleased, and took the picture of Greeley Square, which he considered a masterpiece of color interpretation. This somehow sealed the friendship between these two, and Monsieur Charles was anxious to see Eugene's interests properly forwarded. He asked him to leave three of his scenes on sale for a time, and he would see what he could do. Meanwhile, Eugene, with thirteen hundred added to the thousand and some odd dollars he had left in his bank from previous earnings, was convinced that his career was made, and decided, as he had planned to go to Paris, for the summer at least. This trip, so exceptional to him, so epoch-making, was easily arranged. All the time he had been in New York, he had heard more in his circle of Paris than of any other city. Its streets, its quarters, its museums, its theaters and opera were already almost a commonplace to him. The cost of living, the ideal methods of living, the way to travel, what to see, how often he had sat and listened to descriptions of these things. Now he was going. Angela took the initiative in arranging all the practical details, such as looking up the steamship routes, deciding on the size of trunks required, what to take, 
buying the tickets, looking up the rates of the different hotels and pensions at which they might possibly stay. She was so dazed by the glory that had burst upon her husband's life that she scarcely knew what to do or what to make of it. Then Mr. Beardall, she said to Eugene, referring to one of the assistant steamship agents with whom she had taken counsel, tells me that if we are just going for the summer, it's foolish to take anything but absolute necessaries. He says we can buy so many nice little things to wear over there if we need them, and then I can bring them back duty-free in the fall. Eugene approved of this. He thought Angela would like to see the shops. They finally decided to go via London, returning direct from Havre, and on the 10th of May they departed, arriving in London a week later, and in Paris on the 1st of June. Eugene was greatly impressed with London. He had arrived in time to miss the British damp and cold, and to see London through a golden haze which was entrancing. Angela objected to the shops, which she described as punk, and to the condition of the lower classes who were so poor and wretchedly dressed. She and Eugene discussed the interesting fact that all Englishmen looked exactly alike, dressed, walked, and wore their hats and carried their canes exactly alike. Eugene was impressed with the apparent go of the men, their smartness and dapperness, the women he objected to in the main as being dowdy and homely and awkward. But when he reached Paris, what a difference! In London, because of the lack of sufficient means, he did not feel that as yet he had sufficient to permit him to indulge in the more expensive comforts and pleasures of the city, and for the want of someone to provide him with proper social introductions, he was compelled to content himself with that superficial exterior aspect of things which only the casual traveller sees, the winding streets, the crush of traffic, London Tower, Windsor Castle, the Inns of Court, the Strand, Piccadilly, St. Paul's, and, of course, the National Gallery and the British Museum. South Kensington and all those various endowed palaces where objects of art are displayed pleased him greatly. In the main he was struck with the conservatism of London, its atmosphere of empire, its soldiery, and the like though he considered it drab, dull, less strident than New York, and really less picturesque. When he came to Paris, however, all this was changed. Paris is of itself a holiday city, one whose dress is always gay, inviting fresh, like one who sets forth to spend a day in the country. As Eugene stepped onto the dock at Calais, and later as he journeyed across and into the city, he could feel the vast difference between France and England. The one country seemed young, hopeful, American, even foolishly gay. The other, serious, speculative, dour. Eugene had taken a number of letters from Monsieur Charles, Hudson Dula, Louis de Sa, Leonard Baker, and others, who, on hearing that he was going, had volunteered to send him the friends in Paris who might help him. The principal thing, if he did not wish to maintain a studio of his own, and did wish to learn, was to live with some pleasant French family where he could hear French and pick it up quickly. If he did not wish to do this, the next best thing was to settle in the Montmartre district, in some section or court where he could obtain a nice studio, and where there were a number of American or English students. Some of the Americans, to whom he had letters, were already domiciled here. With a small calling list of friends who spoke English, he would do very well. You will be surprised, Whitla, said Desay to him one day, how much English you can get understood by making intelligent signs. Eugene had laughed at Desay's description of his own difficulties and successes, but he found that Desay was right. Signs went very far, and they were, as a rule, thoroughly intelligible. The studio, which he and Angela eventually took after a few days spent at a hotel, was a comfortable one on the third floor of a house which Eugene found ready to his hand, recommended by Monsieur Arquin of the Paris branch of Kellner and Son. Another artist, Finley Wood, whom afterwards Eugene recalled as having been mentioned to him by Ruby Kenny in Chicago, was leaving Paris for the summer. Because of Monsieur Charles' impressive letter, 
Monsieur Arquin was most anxious that Eugene should be comfortably installed and suggested that he take this, the charge being anything he cared to pay, 40 francs a month. Eugene looked at it and was delighted. It was in the back of the house, looking out on a little garden, and because of a westward slope of the ground from this direction and an accidental breach in the building line commanded a wide sweep of the city of Paris, the twin towers of Notre Dame, the sheer rise of the Eiffel Tower. It was fascinating to see the lights of the city blinking of an evening. Eugene would invariably draw his chair close to his favorite window when he came in, while Angela made lemonade or iced tea or practice her culinary art on a chafing dish. In presenting to him an almost standard American menu, she exhibited the executive ability and natural industry, which was her chief characteristic. She would go to the neighboring groceries, rotisseries, patisseries, green vegetable stands, and get the few things she needed in the smallest quantities, always selecting the best and preparing them with the greatest care. She was an excellent cook and loved to set a dainty and shining table. She saw no need of company, for she was perfectly happy alone with Eugene and felt that he must be with her. She had no desire to go anywhere by herself, only with him, and she would hang on every thought and motion, waiting for him to say what his pleasure would be. The wonder of Paris to Eugene was its freshness and the richness of its art spirit as expressed on every hand. He was never weary of looking at the undersized French soldiery, with their wide red trousers, blue coats, and red caps, or the police, with their capes and swords, and the cab drivers with the air of leisure superiority. The Seine, brisk with boats at this season of the year, the Garden of the Tuileries, with its white marble nudes, and formal paths, and stone benches, the Bois, the Champ de Mars, the Trocadero Museum, the Louvre, all the wonder streets and museums held him as in a dream. Gee, he exclaimed to Angela one afternoon, as he followed the banks of the Seine toward his sea, this is certainly the home of the blessed for all good artists. Smell that perfume. It was from a perfume factory in the distance. See that barge? He leaned on the river wall. Ah, he sighed, this is perfect. They went back in the dusk on the roof of an open car. When I die, he sighed, I hope to come to Paris. It's all the heaven I want. Yet, like all perfect delights, it lost some of its savor after a time, though not much. Eugene felt that he could live in Paris if his art would permit him, though he must go back, he knew, for the present, anyhow. Angela, he noticed after a time, was growing in confidence, if not in mentality. From a certain dazed uncertainty, which had characterized her the preceding fall, when she had first come to New York, heightened and increased for the time being by the rush of art life and strange personalities she had encountered there and here, she was blossoming into a kind of assurance born of experience. Finding that Eugene's ideas, feelings, and interests were of the upper world of thought entirely, concerned with types, crowds, the aspect of buildings, streets, skylines, the humors and pathetic aspects of living, she concerned herself solely with the managerial details. It did not take her long to discover that if anyone would relieve Eugene of all care for himself, he would let him do it. It was no satisfaction to him to buy himself anything. He objected to executive and commercial details. If tickets had to be bought, timetables consulted, inquiries made, any labor of argument or dispute engaged in, he was loath to enter on it. You get these, will you, Angela, he would plead. You see him about that. I can't now, will you? Angela would hurry to the task, whatever it was, anxious to show that she was of real use and necessity. On the buses of London, or Paris, as in New York, he was sketching, sketching, sketching. Cabs, little passenger boats on the Seine, characters in the cafes, parks, gardens, music halls, anywhere, anything, for he was practically tireless. All that he wanted was not to be bothered very much, to be left to his own devices. 
Sometimes Angela would pay all the bills for him for a day. She carried his purse, took charge of all the express orders into which their cash had been transferred, kept a list of all their expenditures, did the shopping, buying, paying. Eugene was left to see the thing he wanted to see, to think the things he wanted to think. During all those early days, Angela made a god of him, and he was very willing to cross his legs, Buddha fashion, and act as one. Only at night, when there were no alien sights or sounds to engage his intention, when not even his art could come between them, and she could draw him into her arms, and submerge his restless spirit in the tides of her love, did she feel his equal, really worthy of him. These transports, which came with the darkness, or with the mellow light of the little oil lamp that hung in chains from the ceiling near their wide bed, or in the faint freshness of dawn, with the birds cheeping in the one tree of the little garden below, were to her at once utterly generous and profoundly selfish. She had eagerly absorbed Eugene's philosophy of self-indulgent joy where it concerned themselves, all the more readily, as it coincided with her own vague ideas and her own hot impulses. Angela had come to marriage through years of self-denial, years of bitter longing, for the marriage, perhaps, that would never be. And out of those years she had come to the marriage bed with a cumulative and intense passion, without any knowledge either of the ethics or physiology of sex, except as pertain to her state as a virgin, she was vastly ignorant of marriage itself, the hearsay of girls, the equivocal confessions of newly married women, and the advice of her elder sister, conveyed by heaven only knows what process of conversation, had left her almost as ignorant as before, and now she explored its mysteries with abandon, convinced that the unrestrained gratification of passion was normal and excellent, in addition to being, as she came to find, a universal solvent for all differences of opinion or temperament that threatened their peace of mind. Beginning with their life in the studio on Washington Square, and continuing with even greater fervor now in Paris, there was what might be described as a prolonged riot of indulgence between them, bearing no relation to any necessity in their natures, and certainly none to the demands which Eugene's intellectual and artistic tasks laid upon him. She was to Eugene astonishing and delightful, and yet perhaps not so much delightful as astonishing. Angela was in a sense elemental, but Eugene was not. He was the artist, and this, as in other things, rousing himself to a pitch of appreciation which no strength so undermined by intellectual subtleties could continuously sustain. The excitement of adventure, of intrigue, in a sense, of discovering the secrets of feminine personality, these were really what had constituted the charm, if not the compelling urge, of his romances. To conquer was beautiful, but it was in essence an intellectual enterprise. To see his rash dreams come true in the yielding of the last sweetness possessed by the desired woman had been to him imaginatively, as well as physically, an irresistible thing. But these enterprises were like thin silver strands spun out across an abyss whose beauty, but not whose dangers, were known to him. Still he rejoiced in this magnificent creature joy which Angela supplied. It was, so far as it was concerned, what he thought he wanted. And Angela interpreted her power to respond to what seemed his inexhaustible desire as not only a kindness, but a duty. Eugene set up his easel here, painted from nine to noon, some days, and on others from two to five in the afternoon. If it were dark, he would walk or ride with Angela, or visit the museums, the galleries, and the public buildings, or stroll in the factory or railroad quarters of the city. Eugene sympathized most with somber types, and was constantly drawing something which represented grim care. Aside from the dancers in the music hall, the Tufts, in what later became known as the Apache District, the summer picnicking parties at Versailles and St. Cloud, the boat crowds on the Seine, he drew factory throngs, watchmen, and railroad crossings, market people, market in the dark, 
street sweepers newspaper vendors flower merchants always with a memorable street scene in the background some of the most interesting bits of paris its towers bridges river views facades appeared in background to the grim or picturesque or pathetic character studies it was his hope that he could interest america in these things that his next exhibition would not only illustrate his versatility and persistence of talent but show an improvement in his art a surer sense of color values a greater analytic power in the matter of character a surer selective taste in the matter of composition and arrangement he did not realize that all this might be useless that he was aside from his art living a life which might rob talent of its finest flavor discolor the aspect of the world for himself take scope from imagination and hamper effort with nervous irritation and make accomplishment impossible he had no knowledge of the effect of one's sexual life upon one's work nor what such a life when badly arranged can do to a perfect art how it can distort the sense of color weaken that balanced judgment of character which is so essential to a normal interpretation of life make all striving hopeless take from art its most joyous conception make life itself seem unimportant and death a relief end of section thirty six section thirty seven of the genius by theodore dreiser this librivox recording is in the public domain book two chapter nine the summer passed and with it the freshness and novelty of paris though eugene never really wearied of it the peculiarities of a different national life the variations between this and his own country in national ideals an obviously much more complacent and human attitude toward morals a matter-of-fact acceptance of the ills weaknesses and class differences to say nothing of the general physical appearance the dress habitations and amusements of the people astonished as much as they entertained him he was never weary of studying the differences between american and european architecture noting the pacific manner in which the frenchman appeared to take life listening to angela's unwearied comments on the cleanliness economy thoroughness with which the french women kept house rejoicing in the absence of the american leaning to incessant activity angela was struck by the very moderate prices for laundry the skill with which their concierge who governed this quarter and who knew sufficient english to talk to her did her marketing cooking sewing and entertaining the richness of supply and aimless waste of americans was alike unknown because she was naturally of a domestic turn angela became very intimate with madame bourgoche and learned of her a hundred and one little tricks of domestic economy and arrangement you're a peculiar girl angela eugene once said to her i believe you would rather sit downstairs and talk to that french woman then meet the most interesting literary or artistic personage that ever was what do you find that's so interesting to talk about oh nothing much replied angela who was not unconscious of the implied hint of her artistic deficiencies she's such a smart woman she's so practical she knows more in a minute about saving and buying and making a little go a long way than any american woman i ever saw I'm not interested in her any more than I am in anyone else. All the artistic people do that I can see is to run around and pretend that they're a whole lot when they're not. Eugene saw that he had made an irritating reference, not wholly intended in the way it was being taken. I'm not saying she isn't able, he went on. One talent is as good as another, I suppose. She certainly looks clever enough to me. Where's her husband? He was killed in the army, returned Angela, dolefully. Well, I suppose you'll learn enough from her to run a hotel when you get back to New York. You don't know enough about housekeeping now, do you? Eugene smiled with his implied compliment. He was anxious to get Angela's mind off the art question. He hoped she would feel or see 
that he meant nothing, but she was not so easily pacified. "'You don't think I'm so bad, Eugene, do you?' she asked after a moment. "'You don't think it makes so much difference whether I talk to Madame Borgosch? She isn't so dull. She's awfully smart. You haven't talked to her. She says she can tell by looking at you that you're a great artist. You're different. You remind her of a Mr. Degas who once lived here. Was he a great artist?' was he said eugene well i guess yes did he have this studio oh a long time ago fifteen years ago eugene smiled beautifully this was a great compliment he could not help liking madame bourgoche for it she was bright no doubt of that or she would not be able to make such a comparison angela drew from him as before that her domesticity and housekeeping skill was as important as anything else in the world, and having done this, was satisfied and cheerful once more. Eugene thought how little art, or conditions, or climate, or country, altered the fundamental characteristics of human nature. Here he was in Paris, comparatively well supplied with money, famous, or in the process of becoming so, and quarreling with Angela over little domestic idiosyncrasies, just as in Washington Square. By late September, Eugene had most of his Paris sketches so well laid in that he could finish them anywhere. Some fifteen were as complete as they could be made. A number of others were nearly so. He decided that he had had a profitable summer. He had worked hard, and here was the work to show for it. Twenty-six canvases, which were as good, in his judgment, as those he had painted in New York. They had not taken so long, but he was surer of himself, surer of his method. He parted reluctantly with all the lovely things he had seen, believing that this collection of Parisian views would be as impressive to Americans as had been his New York views. Monsieur Arquin, for one, and many others, including the friends of Dessa and Dula, were delighted with them. The former expressed the belief that some of them might be sold in France. Eugene returned to America with Angela, and learning that he might stay in the old studio until December 1st, settled down to finish the work for his exhibition there. The first suggestion that Eugene had that anything was wrong with him, aside from a growing apprehensiveness as to what the American people would think of his French work, was in the fall when he began to imagine, or perhaps it was really true, that coffee did not agree with him. He had for several years now been free of his old-time complaint, stomach trouble, but gradually it was beginning to reappear, and he began to complain to Angela that he was feeling an irritation after his meals, that coffee came up in his throat. "'I think I'll have to try tea or something else, if this doesn't stop,' he observed. She suggested chocolate, and he changed to that, but this merely resulted in shifting the ill to another quarter. He now began to quarrel with his work, not being able to get a certain effect, and having sometimes altered and re-altered and re-re-altered a canvas until it bore little resemblance to the original arrangement. He would grow terribly discouraged, or believe that he had attained perfection at last, only to change his mind the following morning. Now he would say, I think I have the thing right at last, thank heaven. Angela would heave a sigh of relief for she could feel instantly any distress or inability that he felt. But her joy was of short duration. In a few hours she would find him working at the same canvas, changing something. He grew thinner and paler at this time, and his apprehensions as to his future rapidly became morbid. "'By George, Angela,' he said to her one day, "'it would be a bad thing for me if I were to become sick now. "'It's just the time that I don't want to.' I want to finish this exhibition upright and then go to London. If I could do London and Chicago as I did New York, I would be just about made. But if I'm going to get sick... Oh, you're not going to get sick, Eugene, replied Angela. You just think you are. You want to remember that you've worked very hard this summer. And think how hard you worked last winter. You need a good rest. That's what you need. Why don't you stop after you get this exhibition ready and rest a while? You have enough to live on for a little bit. Monsieur Charles will probably sell a few more of those pictures, or some of those will sell, 
and then you can wait. Don't try to go to London in the spring. Go on a walking tour, or go down south, or just rest a while, anywhere. That's what you need. Eugene realized vaguely that it wasn't rest that he needed so much as peace of mind. He was not tired. He was merely nervously excited and apprehensive. He began to sleep badly, to have terrifying dreams, to feel that his heart was failing him. At two o'clock in the morning, the hour when for some reason human vitality appears to undergo a peculiar disturbance, he would wake with a sense of sinking physically. His pulse would appear to be very low, and he would feel his wrists nervously. Not infrequently he would break out in a cold perspiration and would get up and walk about to restore himself. Angela would rise and walk with him. One day at his easel he was seized with a peculiar nervous disturbance, a sudden glittering light before his eyes, a rumbling in his ears, and a sensation which was as if his body were being pricked with ten million needles. It was as though his whole nervous system had given way at every minute point and division. For the time being he was intensely frightened, believing that he was going crazy, but he said nothing. It came to him as a staggering truth that the trouble with him was overindulgence physically, that the remedy was abstinence, complete or at least partial, that he was probably so far weakened mentally and physically that it would be very difficult for him to recover, that his ability to paint might be seriously affected, his life blighted. He stood before his canvas holding his brush, wondering. When the shock had completely gone, he laid the brush down with a trembling hand. He walked to the window, wiped his cold, damp forehead with his hand, and then turned to get his coat from the closet. "'Where are you going?' asked Angela. "'For a little walk. I'll be back soon. I don't feel just as fresh as I might.' She kissed him goodbye at the door and let him go, but her heart troubled her. "'I'm afraid Eugene is going to get sick,' she thought. "'He ought to stop work.'" End of section 37「Section thirty eight of the Genius by Theodore Dreiser. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Book two, chapter ten. It was the beginning of a period destined to last five or six years, in which, to say the least, Eugene was not himself. He was not in any sense out of his mind. If power to reason clearly, jest sagely, argue, and read intelligently, or any evidences of sanity. But privately his mind was a maelstrom of contradictory doubts, feelings, and emotions. Always of a philosophic and introspective turn, this peculiar faculty of reasoning, deeply and feeling emotionally, were now turned upon himself and his own condition, and, as in all such cases, where we peer too closely into the subtleties of creation, confusion was the result. Previously, he had been well satisfied that the world knew nothing. Neither in religion, philosophy, nor science was there any answer to the riddle of existence. Above and below the little scintillating plane of man's thought was what? Beyond the optic strength of the greatest telescope, far out upon the dim horizons of space, were clouds of stars. What were they doing out there? Who governed them? When were their sidereal motions calculated? He figured life as a grim, dark mystery, a sad, semi-conscious activity turning aimlessly in the dark. No one knew anything, God knew nothing, himself least of all. Malevolence, life living on death, plain violence, these were the chief characteristics of existence. If one failed of strength in any way, if life were not kind in its bestowal of gifts, if one were not born to fortune's pampering care, the rest was misery. In the days of his strength and prosperity, the spectacle of existence had been sad enough. In the hours of threatened delay and defeat, it seemed terrible. Why, if his art failed him now, what had he? Nothing. A little puny reputation which he could not sustain. No money, a wife to take care of, 
years of possible suffering and death, the abyss of death. When he looked into that, after all life and hope, how it shocked him, how it hurt. Here was life and happiness and love and health. There was death and nothingness, eons and eons of nothingness. He did not immediately give up hope, immediately succumb to the evidences of a crumbling reality. For months and months he fancied each day that this was a temporary condition, that drugs and doctors could heal him. There were various remedies that were advertised in the papers, blood purifiers, nerve restorers, brain foods, which were announced at once as specifics and cures. And while he did not think that the ordinary patent medicine had anything of value in it, he did imagine that some good could be had from tonics, or the tonic. A physician whom he consulted recommended rest and an excellent tonic which he knew of. He asked whether he was subject to any wasting disease. Eugene told him no. He confessed to an overindulgence in the sex relationship, but the doctor did not believe that ordinarily this should bring about a nervous decline. Hard work must have something to do with it over anxiety. Some temperaments, such as his, were predisposed at birth to nervous breakdowns. They had to guard themselves. Eugene would have to be very careful. He should eat regularly, sleep as long as possible, observe regular hours. A system of exercise might not be a bad thing for him. He could get him a pair of Indian clubs or dumbbells or an exerciser and bring himself back to health that way. Eugene told Angela that he believed he would try exercising and join the gymnasium. He took a tonic, walked with her a great deal, sought to ignore the fact that he was nervously depressed. These things were of practically no value, for the body had apparently been drawn a great distance below normal, and all the hell of a subnormal state had to be endured before it could gradually come into its own again. In the meantime, he was continuing his passional relations with Angela, in spite of a growing judgment that they were in some way harmful to him. But it was not easy to refrain, and each failure to do so made it harder. It was a customary remark of his that he must quit this, but it was like the self-apologetic assurance of the drunkard that he must reform. Now that he had stepped out into the limelight of public observation, now that artists and critics and writers somewhat knew of him, and in their occasional way were wondering what he was doing, it was necessary that he should bestir himself to a special effort in order to satisfy the public as to the enduring quality of his art. He was glad, once he realized, that he was in for a siege of bad weather, that his Paris drawings had been so nearly completed before the break came. By the day he suffered the peculiar nervousness which seemed to mark the opening of his real decline. He had completed twenty-two paintings, which Angela begged him not to touch, and by sheer strength of will, though he misdoubted gravely, he managed to complete five more. All of these Monsieur Charles came to see on occasion, and he approved of them highly. He was not so sure that they would have the appeal of the American pictures, for after all the city of Paris had been pretty well done over and over in the illustration and genre work. It was not so new as New York. The things Eugene chose were not as unconventional. Still, he could say truly, they were exceptional. They might try an exhibition of them later in Paris if they did not take here. He was very sorry to see that Eugene was in poor health and urged him to take care of himself. It seemed as if some malign planetary influence were affecting him. Eugene knew of astrology and palmistry, and one day... In a spirit of curiosity and vague apprehensiveness, consulted a practitioner of the former, receiving for his dollar the statement that he was destined to great fame in either art or literature, but that he was entering a period of stress which would endure for a number of years. Eugene's spirits sank perceptibly. The musty old gentleman who essayed his books of astrological lore shook his head. He had a rather noble growth of white hair and a white beard, 
but his coffee-stained vest was covered with tobacco ash and his collar and cuffs were dirty it looks pretty bad between your twenty-eighth and thirty-second year but after that there is a notable period of prosperity somewhere around your thirty-eighth or thirty-ninth year there is some more trouble a little but you will come out of that that is it looks as though you would your stars show you to be of a nervous imaginative character inclined to worry and i see that your kidneys are weak you ought never to take much medicine your sign is inclined to that but it is without benefit to you you will be married twice but i don't see any children he rambled on dolefully and eugene left in great gloom so it was written in the stars that he was to suffer a period of decline and there was to be more trouble for him in the future but he did see a period of great success for him between his thirty-second and his thirty-eighth years. That was some comfort. Who was the second woman he was to marry? Was Angela going to die? He walked the streets this early December afternoon, thinking, thinking. The Blue family had heard a great deal of Eugene's success since Angela had come to New York. There had never been a week, but at least one letter, and sometimes two, had gone the rounds of the various members of the family. It was written to Marietta primarily, but Mrs. Blue, Jotham, the boys, and the several sisters all received it by turns. Thus the whole regiment of Blue connections knew exactly how it was with Angela, and even better than it was. For although things had looked prosperous enough, Angela had not stayed within the limits of bare fact in describing her husband's success. She added atmosphere, non-fictitious, but the seeming glory which dwelt in her mind, until the various connections of the Blue family, Marietta in particular, were convinced that there was nothing but dignity and bliss in store for the wife of so talented a man. The studio life which Angela had seen, here and in Paris, the picturesque descriptions which came from London and Paris, the personalities of Monsieur Charles, Monsieur Arquin, Isaac Wertheim, Henry L. Tomlins, Luke Severus, all the celebrities whom they met, both in New York and abroad, had been described at length. There was not a dinner, a luncheon, a reception, a tea party, which was not pictured in all its native colors and more. Eugene had become somewhat of a demigod to his Western connections. The quality of his art was never questioned. It was only a little time now before he would be rich, or at least well-to-do. All the relatives hoped that he would bring Angela home some day on a visit, to think that she should have married such a distinguished man. In the Whitla family it was quite the same. Eugene had not been home to see his parents since his last visit to Blackwood, but they had not been without news. For one thing, Eugene had been neglectful, and somewhat because of this Angela had taken it upon herself to open up a correspondence with his mother. She wrote that of course she didn't know her, but that she was terribly fond of Eugene, that she hoped to make him a good wife, and that she hoped to make herself a satisfactory daughter-in-law. Eugene was so dilatory about writing. She would write for him, now, and his mother should hear every week. She asked if she and her husband couldn't manage to come and see them sometime. She would be so glad, and it would do Eugene so much good. She asked if she couldn't have Myrtle's address. They had moved from Ottumwa, and if Sylvia wouldn't write occasionally. She sent a picture of herself and Eugene, a sketch of the studio, which Eugene had made one day, a sketch of herself looking pensively out of the window into Washington Square, pictures from his first show published in the newspapers, accounts of his work, criticisms, all reached the members of both families impartially, and they were kept well aware of how things were going. During the time that Eugene was feeling so badly, and because, if he were going to lose his health, it might be necessary to economize greatly, it occurred to Angela that it might be advisable for them to go home for a visit. While her family were not rich, they had sufficient means to live on. Eugene's mother also was constantly writing, wanting to know why they didn't come out there for a while. She could not see why Eugene could not paint his pictures as well in Alexandria as in New York or Paris. 
Eugene listened to this willingly, for it occurred to him that instead of going to London, he might do Chicago next, and he and Angela could stay a while at Blackwood and another while at his own home. They would be welcome guests. The condition of his finances at this time was not exactly bad, but it was not very good. Of the thirteen hundred dollars he had received for the first three pictures sold, eleven hundred had been used on the foreign trip. He had since used three hundred dollars of his remaining capital of twelve hundred, but M. Charles's sale of two pictures at four hundred each had swelled his bank balance to seventeen hundred dollars. However, on this he had to live now until additional pictures were disposed of. He daily hoped to hear of additional sales, but none occurred. Moreover, his exhibition in January did not produce quite the impression he thought it would. It was fascinating to look at. The critics and the public imagined that by now he must have created a following for himself, else why should M. Charles make a feature of his work? But Charles pointed out that these foreign studies could not hope to appeal to Americans, as did the American things. He indicated that they might take better in France. Eugene was depressed by the general tone of the opinions, but this was due more to his unhealthy state of mind than to any inherent reason for feeling so. There was still Paris to try, and there might be some sales of his work here. The latter were slow in materializing, however, and because by February he had not been able to work, and because it was necessary that he should husband his resources as carefully as possible, he decided to accept Angela's family's invitation, as well as that of his own parents, and spend some time in Illinois and Wisconsin. Perhaps his health would become better. He decided also that, if his health permitted, he would work in Chicago. End of section 38「Section thirty nine of the Genius by Theodore Dreiser. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Book two, chapter eleven, part one. It was in packing the trunks and leaving the studio in Washington Square, owing to the continued absence of Mr. Dexter, they had never been compelled to vacate it, that Angela came across the first evidence of Eugene's duplicity. Because of his peculiar indifference to everything except matters which related to his art, he had put the letters which he had received in times past from Christina Channing, as well as the one and only one from Ruby Kenny, in a box which had formerly contained writing paper and which he threw carelessly in a corner of his trunk. He had by this time forgotten all about them, though his impression was that he had placed them somewhere where they would not be found. When Angela started to lay out the various things which occupied it, she came across this box and, opening it, took out the letters. Curiosity as things relative to Eugene was at this time the dominant characteristic of her life. She could neither think nor reason outside of this relationship which bound her to him. He and his affairs were truly the sum and substance of her existence. She looked at the letters oddly and then opened one, the first from Christina. It was dated Florizel the summer of three years before, when she was waiting so patiently for him at Blackwood. It began conservatively enough, Dear E, but it concerned itself immediately with references to an apparently affectionate relationship. I went this morning to see if by chance there were any tell-tale evidences of either Diana or Adonis at Arcady. There were none of importance. A hairpin or two, a broken mother-of-pearl button from a summer waist, the stub of a lead pencil, wherewith a certain genius sketched, the trees seemed just as unconscious of any nymphs or hamadryads as they could be. The smooth grass was quite unruffled of any feet. It is strange how much the trees and forests know and keep their counsel. And how is the hot city by now? Do you miss a certain evenly swung hammock, or the odor of leaves and the dew? Don't work too hard. You have an easy future and almost too much vitality. 
more repose for you sir and considerably more optimism of thought i send you good wishes diana angela wondered at once who diana was for before she had begun the letter she had looked for a signature on the succeeding page then after reading this she hurried feverishly from letter to letter seeking a name there were none diana of the mountains the hamadryad the wood nymph c c c so they ran confusing badgering enraging her until all at once it came to light her first name at last it was on the letter from baltimore suggesting that he come to florizel christina ah she thought christina that is her name then she hurried back to read the remaining epistles hoping to find some clue to her surname they were all of the same character in the manner of writing she despised top lofty make-believe the nasty hypocritical can't and make-believe superiority of the studios how angela hated her from that moment how she could have taken her by the throat and beaten her head against the trees she described oh the horrid creature how dare she and eugene how could he what a way to reward her love what an answer to make to all her devotion at the very time when she was waiting so patiently he was in the mountains with his diana and here she was packing his trunk for him like the little slave that she was when he cared so little he apparently cared so little all this time how could he ever have cared for her and done anything like this he didn't he never had dear heaven she began clenching and unclenching her hands dramatically working herself into that frenzy of emotion and regret which was her most notable characteristic all at once she stopped there was another letter in another handwriting on cheaper paper ruby was the signature dear eugene she read i got your note several weeks ago but i couldn't bring myself to answer it before this i know everything is over between us and that is all right i suppose it has to be you couldn't love any woman long i think i know what you say about having to go to new york to broaden your field is true you ought to but i'm sorry you didn't come out you might have still i don't blame you eugene it isn't much different from what has been going on for some time i have cared but i'll get over that i know and i won't ever think hard of you won't you return me the notes i have sent you from time to time and my picture you won't want them now ruby i stood by the window last night and looked out on the street the moon was shining and those dead trees were waving in the wind i saw the moon on that pool of water over in the field it looked like silver oh eugene i wish that i were dead angela got up as eugene had when she read this the pathos struck home for somehow it matched her own ruby who was she where had she been concealed while she angela was coming to chicago was this the fall and winter of their engagement it certainly was look at the date he had given her the diamond ring on her finger that fall he had sworn eternal affection he had sworn there was never another girl like her in all the world and yet at that very time he was apparently paying court to this woman if nothing worse heaven could anything like this really be he was telling her that he loved her and making love to this ruby at the same time he was kissing and fondling her and ruby too was there ever such a situation he eugene witla to deceive her this way no wonder he wanted to get rid of her when he came to new york he would have treated her as he had this ruby and christina this christina where was she who was she what was she doing now she jumped up prepared to go to eugene and charge him with his iniquities but remembered that he was out of the studio that he had gone for a walk he was sick now very sick would she dare to reproach him with these reprehensible episodes she came back to the trunk where she was working and sat down her eyes were hard and cold for the time but at the same time there was a touch of terror and of agonized affection a face that in ordinary lines of its repose was very much like that 
of a Madonna, was now drawn and peaked and gray. Apparently Christina had forsaken him, or it might be that they still corresponded secretly. She got up again at that thought. Still the letters were old. It looked as though all communication had ceased two years ago. What had he written to her? Love notes? Letters full of wooing phrases, such as he had written to her? Oh, the instability of men, the insincerity, the lack of responsibility and sense of duty. Her father, what a different man he was. Her brothers, their word was their bond. And here she was, married to a man who, even in the days of his most ardent wooing, had been deceiving her. She had let him lead her astray, too, disgrace her own home. Tears came after a while, hot, scalding tears, that seared her cheeks. And now she was married to him, and he was sick, and she would have to make the best of it. She wanted to make the best of it, for after all she loved him. But oh, the cruelty, the insincerity, the unkindness, the brutality of it all. The fact that Eugene was out for several hours following her discovery gave her ample time to reflect as to a suitable course of action. Being so impressed by the genius of the man, as imposed upon her by the opinion of others and her own affection, she could not readily think of anything save some method of ridding her soul of this misery and him of his evil tendencies, of making him ashamed of his wretched career, of making him see how badly he had treated her and how sorry he ought to be. She wanted him to feel sorry, very sorry, so that he would be a long time repenting and suffering. But she feared at the same time that she could not make him do that. He was so ethereal, so indifferent, so lost in contemplation of life, that he could not be made to think of her. That was her one complaint. He had other gods before her, the god of his art, the god of nature, the god of people as a spectacle. Frequently she had complained to him in this last year. You don't love me, you don't love me. But he would answer, oh yes I do. I can't be talking to you all the time, angel face. I have work to do. My art has to be cultivated. I can't be making love all the time. Oh, it isn't that, it isn't that, she would exclaim passionately. You just don't love me like you ought to. You just don't care. If you did, I'd feel it. Oh, Angela, he answered, why do you talk so? Why do you carry on so? You're the funniest girl I ever knew. Now be reasonable. Why don't you bring a little philosophy to bear? We can't be billing and cooing all the time. Billing and cooing? That's the way you think of it? That's the way you talk of it? As though it were something you had to do? Oh, I hate love. I hate life. I hate philosophy. I wish I could die. Now, Angela, for heaven's sakes, why will you take on so? I can't stand this. I can't stand these tantrums of yours. They're not reasonable. You know I love you. Why haven't I shown it? Why should I have married you if I didn't? I wasn't obliged to marry you. Oh, dear, oh, dear, Angela would sob on, wringing her hands. Oh, you really don't love me. You don't care. And it will go on this way, getting worse and worse, with less and less of love and feeling until after a while you won't even want to see me any more. You'll hate me. Oh, dear, oh, dear. Eugene felt keenly the pathos involved in this picture of decaying love. In fact, her fear of the disaster which might overtake her little bark of happiness was sufficiently well-founded. It might be that his affection would cease. It wasn't even affection now, in the true sense of the word, a passionate intellectual desire for her companionship. He never had really loved her for her mind, the beauty of her thoughts. As he meditated, he realized that he had never reached an understanding with her by an intellectual process at all. It was emotional, subconscious, a natural drawing together, which was not based on reason and spirituality, of contemplation apparently, but on grosser emotions and desires. Physical desire had been involved, strong, raging, uncontrollable. And for some reason, he had always felt sorry for her. He always had. She was so little, so conscious of disaster, so afraid of life and what it might do to her. It was a shame to wreck her hopes and desires. At the same time, 
He was sorry now for this bondage he had let himself into, this yoke which he had put about his neck. He could have done so much better. He might have married a woman of wealth or a woman with artistic perceptions and philosophic insight like Christina Channing, who would be peaceful and happy with him. Angela couldn't be. He really didn't admire her enough and couldn't fuss over her enough. Even while he was soothing her in these moments, trying to make her believe that there was no basis for her fears, sympathizing with her subconscious intuitions that all was not well, he was thinking of how different his life might have been. It won't end that way, he would soothe. Don't cry. Come now, don't cry. We're going to be very happy. I'm going to love you always, just as I'm loving you now. And you're going to love me. Won't that be all right? Come on now, cheer up. Don't be so pessimistic. Come on, Angela. Please do, please. Angela would brighten after a time, but there were spells of apprehension and gloom. They were common, apt to burst forth like a summer storm when neither of them was really expecting it. The discovery of these letters now checked the feeling with which she tried to delude herself at times, that there might be anything more than kindness here. They confirmed her suspicions that there was not, and brought on that sense of defeat and despair which so often and so tragically overcame her. It did at a time, too, when Eugene needed her undivided consideration and feeling for he was in a wretched state of mind. To have her quarrel with him now, lose her temper, fly into rages, and compel him to console her, was very trying. He was in no mood for it, could not very well endure it without injury to himself. He was seeking for an atmosphere of joyousness, wishing to find a cheerful optimism somewhere which could pull him out of himself and make him whole. Not infrequently, he dropped in to see Norma Whitmore, Isadora Crane, who was getting along very well on the stage, Hedda Anderson, who had a natural charm of intellect with much vivacity, even though she was a model, and now and then Miriam Finch. The latter was glad to see him alone, almost as a testimony against Angela. Though she would not go out of her way to conceal from Angela the fact that he had been there, the others though he said nothing, assumed that since Angela did not come with him, he wanted nothing said and observed his wish. They were inclined to think that he had made a matrimonial mistake and was possibly artistically or intellectually lonely. All of them noted his decline in health with considerate apprehension and sorrow. It was too bad, they thought, if his health was going to fail him just at this time. Eugene lived in fear lest Angela should become aware of any of these visits. He thought he could not tell her, because in the first place she would resent his not having taken her with him, and in the next, if he had proposed at first, she would have objected, or set another date, or asked pointless questions. He liked the liberty of going where he pleased, saying nothing, not feeling it necessary to say anything. He longed for the freedom of his old, pre-matrimonial days. Just at this time, because he could not work artistically, and because he was in need of diversion and of joyous artistic palaver, he was especially miserable. Life seemed very dark and ugly. End of section 39「Section 40 of the Genius by Theodore Dreiser this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Book Two, Chapter Eleven, Part Two. Eugene, returning and feeling as usual, depressed about his state, sought to find consolation in her company. He came in at one o'clock, their usual lunch hour, and finding Angela still working, said, George, but you like to keep at things when you get started, don't you? You're a regular little workhorse having much trouble? No, replied Angela dubiously. Eugene noted the tone of her voice. He thought she was not very strong, and this packing was getting on her nerves. Fortunately, there were only some trunks to look after, for the vast mass of their housekeeping materials belonged to the studio. 
Still, no doubt she was weary. Are you very tired? he asked. No, she replied. You look it, he said, slipping his arm about her. Her face, which he turned up with his hand, was pale and drawn. It isn't anything physical, she replied, looking away from him in a tragic way. It's just my heart. It's here. And she laid her hand over her heart. What's the matter now? he asked, suspecting something emotional, though for the life of him he could not imagine what. Does your heart hurt you? It isn't my real heart, she returned. It's just my mind, my feelings, though I don't suppose they ought to matter. What's the matter now, angel face, he persisted, for he was sorry for her. This emotional ability of hers had the power to move him. It might have been acting or it might not have been. It might be either a real or a fancied woe. In either case, it was real to her. What's come up, he continued? Aren't you just tired? Suppose we quit this and go out somewhere and get something to eat. You'll feel better. No, I couldn't eat, she replied. I'll stop now and get your lunch, but I don't want anything. Oh, what's the matter, Angela, he begged. I know there's something. Now what is it? You're tired? or you're sick, or something has happened. Is it anything that I've done? Look at me, is it? Angela held away from him, looking down. She did not know how to begin this, but she wanted to make him terribly sorry if she could, as sorry as she was for herself. She thought he ought to be, that if he had any true feelings of shame and sympathy in him, he would be. Her own condition in the face of his shameless past was terrible. She had no one to love her. She had no one to turn to. Her own family did not understand her life any more. It had changed so. She was a different woman now, greater, more important, more distinguished. Her experiences with Eugene here, in New York, in Paris, in London, and even before her marriage, in Chicago and Blackwood, had changed her point of view. She was no longer the same in her ideas, she thought, and to find herself deserted in this way emotionally, not really loved, not ever having been really loved, but just toyed with, made a doll and a plaything, was terrible. Oh, dear, she exclaimed in a shrill staccato, I don't know what to do. I don't know what to say. I don't know what to think. If I only knew how to think or what to do. What's the matter, begged Eugene, releasing his hold and turning his thoughts partially to himself and to his own condition as well as to hers. His nerves were put on edge by these emotional tantrums. His brain fairly ached. It made his hands tremble. In his days of physical and nervous soundness it did not matter. But now when he was sick, when his own heart was weak, as he fancied, and his nerves set to jangling, by the least discord, it was almost more than he could bear. Why don't you speak, he insisted. You know I can't stand this. I'm in no condition. What's the trouble? What's the use of carrying on this way? Are you going to tell me? There, Angela said, pointing her finger at the box of letters she had laid aside on the window sill. She knew he would see them, would remember instantly what they were about. Eugene looked. The box came into his memory instantly. He picked it up nervously, sheepishly, for this was like a blow in the face which he had no power to resist. The whole peculiar nature of his transactions with Ruby and with Christina came back to him, not as they looked to him at the time, but as they were appearing to Angela now. What must she think of him? Here he was protesting right along that he loved her that he was happy and satisfied to live with her, that he was not interested in any of these other women, whom she knew to be interested in him, and of whom she was inordinately jealous, that he had always loved her and her only. And yet, here were these letters suddenly come to light, giving mind all the protestations and asservations, making him look like a coward, the blackguard, the moral thief that he knew himself to be to be dragged out of the friendly darkness of lack of knowledge and understanding on her part and set forth under the clear white light of positive proof he stared helplessly his nerves trembling his brain aching for truly 
he was in no condition for an emotional argument. And yet Angela was crying now. She had walked away from him and was leaning against the mantelpiece, sobbing as if her heart would break. There was a real convincing ache in the sound the vibration expressing the sense of loss and defeat and despair which she felt. He was staring at the box, wondering why he had been such an idiot as to leave them in his trunk, to have saved them at all. "'Well, I don't know that there is anything to say to that,' he observed finally, strolling over to where she was. There wasn't anything he could say that he knew. He was terribly sorry, sorry for her, sorry for himself. "'Did you read them all?' he asked curiously. She nodded her head in the affirmative. "'Well, I didn't care so much for Christina Channing,' he observed, deprecatingly. He wanted to say something, anything, which would relieve her depressed mood. He knew it couldn't be much. If he could only make her believe that there wasn't anything vital in either of these affairs, that his interests and protestations had been of a light, philandering character.' Still, the Ruby Kenny letter showed that she cared for him desperately. He could not say anything against Ruby. Angela caught the name of Christina Channing clearly. It seared itself into her brain. She recalled now that it was she of whom she had heard him speak in a complimentary way from time to time. He had told in studios of what a lovely voice she had, what a charming platform presence she had, how she could sing so feelingly, how intelligently she looked upon life, how good-looking she was, how she was coming back to Grand Opera some day. And he had been in the mountains with her, had made love to her, while she, Angela, was out in Blackwood waiting for him patiently. It aroused on the instant all the fighting jealousy that was in her breast. It was the same jealousy that had determined her once before to hold him in spite of the plotting and scheming that appeared to her to be going on about her. They should not have him, these nasty studio superiorities, not any one of them, nor all of them combined, if they were to unite and try to get him. They had treated her shamefully since she had been in the East. They had almost uniformly ignored her. They would come to see Eugene, of course, and now that he was famous, they could not be too nice to him. But as for her, well, they had no particular use for her. Hadn't she seen it? Hadn't she watched the critical, hypocritical, examining expression in their eyes? She wasn't smart enough. She wasn't literary enough or artistic enough. She knew as much about life as they did and more, ten times as much. And yet because she couldn't strut and pose and stare and talk in an affected voice, they thought themselves superior. And so did Eugene, the wretched creature, superior, the cheap, mean, nasty, selfish upstarts. Why, the majority of them had nothing. Their clothes were mere rags and tags. When you came to examine them closely, badly sewed, of poor material, merely slung together, and yet they wore them with such a grand air. She would show them. She would dress herself, too, one of these days, when Eugene had the means. She was doing it now a great deal more than when she first came, and she would do it a great deal more before long. The nasty, mean, cheap, selfish, make-believe things she would show them. Oh, how she hated them! Now as she cried, she also thought of the fact that Eugene could write love letters to this horrible Christina Channing. One of the same kind, no doubt, her letter showed it. Oh, how she hated her! If she could only get at her to poison her! And her sobs sounded much more of the sorrow she felt than of the rage. She was helpless in a way, and she knew it. She did not dare to show him exactly what she felt. She was afraid of him. He might possibly leave her. He really did not care for her enough to stand everything from her, or did he? This doubt was the one terrible, discouraging, annihilating feature of the whole thing if he only cared i wish you wouldn't cry angela said eugene appealingly after a time it isn't as bad as you think it looks pretty bad but i wasn't married then and i didn't care so very much for these people not as much as you think really i didn't it may look that way to you but i didn't 
didn't care sneered angela all at once flaring up didn't care it looks as though you didn't care with one of them calling you honey boy and adonis and the other saying she wishes she were dead a fine time you'd have convincing anyone that you didn't care and i out in blackwood at the very time longing and waiting for you to come and you up in the mountains making love to another woman oh i know how much you cared you showed how much you cared when you could leave me out there to wait for you eating my heart out while you were off in the mountains having a good time with another woman dear e and precious honey boy and adonis that shows how much you cared doesn't it eugene stared before him helplessly her bitterness and wrath surprised and irritated him he did not know that she was capable of such an awful rage as showed itself in her face and words at this moment and yet he did not know but that she was well justified why so bitter though so almost brutal he was sick had she no consideration for him i tell you it wasn't as bad as you think he said stolidly showing for the first time a trace of temper and opposition i wasn't married then i did like christina channing i did like ruby kenny what of it i can't help it now what am i going to say about it what do you want me to say what do you want me to do oh whimpered angela changing her tone at once from helpless accusing rage to pleading self-commiserating misery and you can stand there and say to me what of it what of it what of it what shall you say what do you think you ought to say and me believing that you were so honorable and faithful oh if i had only known if i had only known i'd had better have drowned myself a hundred times over than have waked and found that i wasn't loved oh dear oh dear i don't know what i ought to do i don't know what i can do but i do love you protested eugene soothingly anxious to say or do anything which would quiet this terrific storm he could not imagine how he could have been so foolish as to leave these letters lying around dear heaven what a mess he had made of this if only he had put them safely outside the home or destroyed them still he had wanted to keep christina's letters they were so charming yes you love me flared angela i see how you love me those letters show it oh dear oh dear i wish i were dead listen to me angela replied eugene desperately i know this correspondence looks bad i did make love to miss kenny and to christina channing but you see i didn't care enough to marry either of them if i had i would have i cared for you believe it or not i married you why did i marry you answer me that i needn't have married you why did i because i loved you of course what other reason could i have because you couldn't get christina channing snapped angela angrily with the intuitive sense of one who reasons from one material fact to another that's why if you could have you would have i know it her letters show it her letters don't show anything of the sort returned eugene angrily i couldn't get her i could have had her easily enough i didn't want her if i had wanted her i would have married her you can bet on that he hated himself for lying in this way but he felt for the time being that he had to do it he did not care to stand in the role of a jilted lover he half fancied that he could have married christina if he had really tried anyhow he said i'm not going to argue that point with you i didn't marry her so there you are and i didn't marry ruby kenny either well you can think all you want but i know i cared for them but i didn't marry them i married you instead i ought to get credit for something on that score i married you because i loved you i suppose that's perfectly plain isn't it he was half convincing himself that he had loved her in some degree yes i see how you loved me persisted angela cogitating this very peculiar fact which he was insisting on and which it was very hard intellectually to overcome you married me because you couldn't very well get out of it that's why oh i know you didn't want to marry me that's very plain you wanted to marry someone else oh dear oh dear oh how you talk eugene replied defiantly 
marry someone else? Who did I want to marry? I could have married often enough if I had wanted to. I didn't want to marry, that's all. Believe it or not, I wanted to marry you, and I did. I don't think you have any right to stand there and argue so. What you say isn't so, and you know it. Angela cogitated this argument further. He had married her. Why had he? He might have cared for Christina and Ruby, but he must have cared for her, too. Why hadn't she thought of that? There was something in it, something besides a mere desire to deceive her. Perhaps he did care for her a little. Anyway, it was plain that she could not get very far by arguing with him. He was getting stubborn, argumentative, contentious. She had not seen him that way before. Oh, she sobbed, taking refuge from this very difficult realm of logic in the safer and more comfortable one of illogical tears. I don't know what to do. I don't know what to think. She was badly treated, no doubt of that. Her life was a failure. But even so, there was some charm about him. As he stood there, looking aimlessly around, defiant at one moment, appealing at another, she could not help seeing that he was not wholly bad. He was just weak on this one point. He loved pretty women. They were always trying to win him to them. He was probably not wholly to blame. If he would only be repentant enough, this thing might be allowed to blow over. It couldn't be forgiven. She never could forgive him for the way he had deceived her. Her ideal of him had been pretty hopelessly shattered. But she might live with him on probation. Angela, he said, while she was still sobbing and feeling that he ought to apologize to her, won't you believe me? Won't you forgive me? I don't like to hear you cry this way. There's no use saying that I didn't do anything. There's no use my saying anything at all, really. You won't believe me. I don't want you to, but I'm sorry. Won't you believe that? Won't you forgive me? Angela listened to this curiously, her thoughts going around in a ring, for she was at once despairing, regretful, revengeful, critical, sympathetic toward him, desirous of retaining her state, desirous of obtaining and retaining his love, desirous of punishing him, desirous of doing any one of a hundred things. Oh, if he had only never done this! And he was sickly, too. He needed her sympathy. "'Won't you forgive me, Angela?' he pleaded softly, laying his hand on her arm. "'I'm not going to do anything like that any more. Won't you believe me? Come on now, quit crying, won't you?' Angela hesitated for a while, lingering dolefully. She did not know what to do, what to say. It might be that he would not sin against her any more. He had not thus far, in so far as she knew. Still this was a terrible revelation. All at once, because he maneuvered himself into a suitable position, and because she herself was weary of fighting and crying, and because she was longing for sympathy, she allowed herself to be pulled into his arms, her head to his shoulder, and there she cried more copulously than ever. Eugene, for the moment, felt terribly grieved. He was really sorry for her. It wasn't right. He ought to be ashamed of himself. He should never have done anything like that. I'm sorry, he whispered. Really, I am. Won't you forgive me? Oh, I don't know what to do, what to think, moaned Angela, after a time. Please do, Angela, he urged, holding her questioningly. There was more of this pleading and emotional badgering until finally, out of sheer exhaustion, Angela said yes. Eugene's nerves were worn to a thread by the encounter. He was pale, exhausted, distraught. Many scenes like this, he thought, would set him crazy. And still he had to go through a world of petting and love-making even now. It was not easy to bring her back to her normal self. It was bad business, this philandering, he thought. It seemed to lead to all sorts of misery for him, and Angela was jealous. Dear heaven, what a wrathful, vicious, contentious nature! she had when she was aroused. He had never suspected that. How could he truly love her when she acted like that? How could he sympathize with her? He recalled how she had sneered at him, how she taunted him with Christina's having discarded him. 
he was weary excited desirous of rest and sleep but now he must make more love he fondled her and by degrees she came out of her blackest mood but he was not really forgiven even then he was only just understood better and she was not truly happy again but only hopeful and watchful end of section forty